Arizona expected this to be a, a in-person event uh, probably around March of last year. And uh, we were pretty much uh, got COVIDed. And so we're, we're, we're in the virtual mode here, but uh, I, I'm really happy to see that there's as many people coming in as there are. And uh, hopefully at some point we can also get together in person and, and uh, share some stories of Doc uh, in person. But uh, anyway, to get started, uh, I'd like to introduce Eric Nelson, who, uh, you know, the past refuge manager of our wonderful refuge and one of Doc's students. So he, he stood the test of the leather tie and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, he passed too. <laughs> so anyway, further, without further ado, uh, inter Eric Nelson. And I don't know how to transfer to Eric. He is on mute. Oh, Eric, you got to unmute. There we go. All right. Well, hello, everybody. And, and I'm uh, very humbled and honored to be doing this introduction. Um, a lot of you knew Doc and, you know, everybody knew Doc in their own way and, um, and through, through different ways. And whether as a student or a colleague or, um, you know, he, he just, uh, was was very much part of the community and the HSU community uh, for for a long time up here. So um, I'll do the best I can to to give you a little bit of background. So Doc left an amazing legacy, and I think it came from the love of what he did. He greatly enjoyed and took pride in his family, his students, uh, his colleagues the department and the university, and especially the subject matter he taught, and especially all things avian. Most likely someone on this call will provide numbers or statistics on years, classes, and grad students taught, which would be great, but I didn't really like or do particularly well in stats in college, so that's probably left to somebody else anyway. Um, Doc was born in the town of Dotson, Montana, which is in the Eastern Plains of Montana, and he received his BS and MS from Washington State University and his PhD from University of Minnesota. His PhD thesis was on wetland management and looking at some of those slides, I guess um, it may have taken place or part of it took place at Mud Lake National Wildlife Refuge, which may explain why he had such an affinity for, for refuges throughout his career. Um, but wetland management along with waterfowl management were two of the main courses he taught to hundreds and hundreds of students at Humboldt State. In his 33 years there, he also taught advanced ornithology, taxidermy, was a department chair twice, helped guide Conservation Unlimited and Conclave students to unmatched success, and generally was an integral player in the overall achievements and success of untold numbers of HSU's wildlife students the department and the university in general. In addition to his support for Humboldt State, Doc was also a strong advo advocate for the establishment of the Arcata Marsh and Wildlife Sanctuary, which has won national and indeed worldwide acclaim. And is an amazing community asset, not to mention an outstanding birding location. In fact, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if Doc had a few birds from there on his yard list. I know he got a snowy owl from the Jacoby Creek Marsh but I digress. From the time he arrived at HSU in 1959 until he passed last December 27th, Doc was considered the Dean of Ornithology and Birding on the North Coast, but his influence spread far wider than that. As anyone who has visited the wildlife building at Humboldt and the bird collection shows, his students and contacts collected birds for the museum from the farthest reaches of the globe. The bird collection also shows the dedication he and his artistic wife Lori had for students, birds, and HSU, as they spent countless hours prepping many of the birds in that collection, which is a worthy legacy just by itself. Doc interacted with everyone who had anything to do with birds or birding. 
His grilling over rare and or questionable bird reports was an intimidating and infamous rite of passage for any new birder or birder new to the area. The recent sightings list on his office door was a precursor to the birding hotline. Only the birding gods know how many classes were skipped because of that list, but as Doc always said, don't let classes get in the way of your education. Of course, he didn't mean his classes. As an instructor, Doc was of the pre-PC era. No inflated grades, participation awards, or late paper excuses, unless you were on a rare bird or collecting birds for him. He was a taskmaster. He could be somewhat intimidating, staring down at you with his raptor-like visage, and we all knew what the leather tie meant. There were some profs and classes one could get by with by coasting, but not Doc's. And if you're fortunate enough to be one of his grad students or even had him on your committee, you undoubtedly remember, perhaps with horror, the nearly unrecognizable redlined cut up return of your first draft. As tough as he could be though, his care for students always shined through. He would always go the extra mile for any student who was willing to try, who was willing to try and be better. As if it were needed, additional evidence for Doc and Lori's thoughtfulness and support for students is shown by the endowed scholarships they set up for HSU Wildlife undergrad and graduate students. Doc had high standards and expectations for himself, his students, and HSU students in that order, but it led to a camaraderie that carried on for many of us beyond HSU and our careers. This camaraderie led to another part of Doc's legacy. Doc was the godfather of the Humboldt Mafia. I'm not sure who came up with that name, Doc himself or some jealous UC Davis Aggie, but again, I digress. For many students of the wildlife program at HSU, the next career step was a job with a state or federal land management agency. Cal California Department of Fish and Game, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, BLM, just any of the alphabet soup agencies that, that were out there. And from the 60s up until even today, many Humboldt State and DOC students were key biologists and managers at the vast majority of wildlife areas, national wildlife refuges, and public lands managed throughout the U.S., but especially the West. It's fair to say that lessons learned in the wetlands and waterfowl management courses that Doc taught have been put into effect on a significant amount of the managed wetlands in the Western United States. At one point in the 90s, while working together with Roy Lowe, another Humboldt or with Fish and Wildlife Service on the Oregon coast, we made a mental run through the management and biological staffs of all the refuges in the West. And I'm pretty sure there wasn't one without at least one member of the Humboldt Mafia. At any meeting held, when people chatted during breaks and the inevitable, where'd you go to school question came up, there was always somebody else from HSU there. Anyway, I'd like to sincerely thank the folks who set this up, Gary Friedrichsen and Rob, and Gary Bloomfield and Bob Brown and Shoshana and um, Doc's kids. And like you all, I look forward to a time post-COVID when we can all gather in person to exchange our favorite doc stories, or even just one-on-one, -on -one, because I think the lesson of camaraderie was perhaps doc's greatest legacy of all. Thanks. Hey, well, thanks, Eric. Uh, was, that's great. Actually, I, I don't think I have read that when it came out. Uh, you get busy doing other things, but that was really well put. And uh, it covered quite a bit of Doc's uh, activities. Um, I'm going to just uh, give a quick note. I, I met Doc in 1964 uh, when I first came to Humboldt. And uh, uh, he had a, a grad student by the name of Fred, Tol uh, was it Taloniker? Taloniker. Yeah, Tol Taloniker. And Taloniker was uh, studying. Uh, the leeches storm petrels and all well all the storm petrels but mainly leeches storm petrels and he was banding them on the offshore rocks and so a couple of my buddies Galen Rathbun and Tim Osborne and I got to climb uh, Little River Rock with Doc uh, in 60 sometime in 64 early 65 
and uh, and then we spent the night on the rock and banded banded storm petrels. And I just I, I probably told this story before, but uh, <laughs> we uh, you know we're sitting there. We had all day. Uh, once we got our our gear onto the onto the rock and climbed to the top of the rock, we pretty much had all day to just sit there after we'd set everything up. And uh, actually, Michael's putting up a picture of, of nesting there, um, you know, doing doing the uh, putting the nets out on the top of the rock. But um, any we uh, we spent the day up there, and I just I was out of, right out of high school, and I remember sitting there with this guy that was saying, "Well, there's a second year herring gull. That's a first year." Western gull. Uh, oh, look at there's a first year ringbill gull, and and you know, and I just went, this guy's lying. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could know that. I mean, they all looked the same to me, of course. And uh, I mean, I gained an early appreciation for Doc's prowess and his abilities uh, at the time. And then, luckily, I, you know, I settled in this area and got to know not only Michael and Tana quite a bit better as they grew up and we grew up together, but also got to spend more time with Doc. So anyway, that's one of the reasons I'm here. I'm, I'm, ho I'm supposedly the host here, but uh, there's a lot of legwork in the background by Rob Fowler and Gary Bloomfield and the rest of the Godwit Dave folks that, uh, you know, go unmentioned because they, they're in the background. But uh, a lot of great people have, have helped in. Mike Harris really, really has done a lot as far as gathering up photos and getting them, getting them out, getting them out to us. So anyway, I, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Stan, uh, Stan's son, Michael, and one of Doc's absolute favorite grad students, I have to say, Tracy. Take it away, Michael. Well, thanks for everybody for participating. And um, it's really nice to have everybody work so hard to pull this off. I want to thank everybody. You know, I have a, a little bit of a different vantage point into dad than most of the students had. You know, it's I got to see what it meant to him to have all you students be part of his life you know he lived for his career and he, he really I remember he once said you know I would do this even if they didn't pay me to do this and um you really made by being a part of his life you really made his life complete for him and I, I really don't think that people really understand what kind of impact you know they had on him they understand what kind of impact he had on on them, but they had on dad was really pretty profound. I mean, he wouldn't have been the same person without all you people. I really wanted to thank all you people for having been part of dad's life. And um, I just want to thank you all for, for being there. You want to say something? Well, I'm Tracy and um, a fan. Um, an adopted little daughter. Um, Doc was everything to me. Uh, he was just so, so special. But I did find out he is, uh, I felt a little bit like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. I was terrified of Doc when I first met him. He, he assured me that women didn't work in the wildlife field at all, and that maybe I should try another major right off. And I said, well, I don't think so. And he says, well, that's a good answer. I'll help you. And so from there on, he was behind me, but very, 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 very terrifying. He knew everything. And so when I say I'm like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, Doc became the big, the wizard. And I was mortified of Doc. And it took years for me to see that the curtain, when it was pulled back, he was actually not a god. He was a human being who loved people loved birds, loved his family, and was totally devoted to helping any student who wanted to be helped. And um, I thank him so much for my career. Um, so, I, and I'm from Washington, and, and I worked 
my full career up there with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And whenever the going got tough, if you know Doc, you'll know this. So he'd talk to me. I'd phone him up and say, this is getting a little rough. And he would go, no, let's go after the pictures. Just go back, keep smiling, work hard. And um, he helped me not only in my career and chasing my dreams, um, but he helped me in my life of being successful, happy, and the human I am today. I, I, there, I, I can't say enough. And I, I got an extra, extra, extra bonus and he's sitting right here next to me. I got brother. And it was, it's so awesome. And I got a sister, Fana too. And I got to be part of their family. And I've been, I can't think of anything that has been a bigger blessing to me than be part of their family. And so I am just really, really, really happy to be here. And I'm really happy that Mike got us on this, this Zoom. I'm not real good at this stuff either. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here. Well, that's great, Tracy. Uh, we've had the pleasure of having Tracy over a couple of times with Doc and Michael and in the past, and uh, she's delightful. I understand she has a new puppy dog, which uh, is that rooster that you were holding up earlier? Okay. <laughs> Well, great. Well, I and I, I'm also going to throw in here that Michael, you know, gets gold stars up and down his back because for 13 to, you know, or more years he took care of his mom and his dad. I mean, he just he took it on, and and like we were talking earlier today, it was the cowboy way. It was the what you, what you did, and Michael did a superlative job, and I know you all. Uh, or many people here uh, witnessed Michael's patience and time with Doc, even as he got older and got maybe even more cantankerous and, and harder to deal with. Michael was, uh, was there for him 100%. So anyway, one of the kids moved to Texas of all places, uh, but I would like to introduce a, a, a pretty good birder on her own right, uh, Tana. Uh, took up a, a, probably a little more active uh, birding than than Michael has, although Michael's really good as well. Um, but but Tana uh, and her husband Larry, uh, you know, have played a, a huge role in in Doc's life, of course, as this as the daughter that she is. So, Tana, if you'd like to take take over and say a few words, we'd love it. Okay. Well, <clears throat> yeah. Uh... I birded, um, mostly I got paid to go birding after I graduated from Humboldt through various agencies until I ended up in Texas. Uh, Texas A&M gave me a call one day when I was working for PG&E and asked, said that they called Humboldt and Humboldt said that, call me and ask me if I wanted to go to grad school and that's how I ended up in Texas. Uh, I think Dr. Copeland is the one who recommended me, but I think dad had a hand in it honestly, um, but he never really fessed up. Uh, but at any rate, I got a pretty good career out of that and I'm pretty sure he had a hand in it. Um, but we retired in 2012 and moved to Washington. So I guess I'm almost a neighbor of Tracy's, not quite, but we're at least in the same state. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be able to see each other more. Um, one of my first birding experiences with dad was before I was a birder. I was uh, 13 years old and dad and I went backpacking in Lassen National Park. And it was a three day loop trail. And we were, you know, two days into the loop and we were hiking down the trail and there was this lovely little lake in the middle of Lassen with a lovely nude lady uh, at the head of the trail. <laughs> Strategically positioned where the trails all came together. Nobody was going to miss her. So here was this 13 year old girl with her father who had a pair of binoculars, mind you, <laughs> and this lovely lady. And I was fairly impressed by her. And uh, I was trying to like point her out to dad, like she was a bird. And dad determinedly would not look at her. And he had his back turned the entire time. And so I finally asked him why he wouldn't look at her. And he said, there was a black back three-toed woodpecker right behind us in the tree. Turned out there really was a black back three-toed woodpecker in that tree. And it was a lifer for him. 
And so when I asked him for further explanation, he says, I've seen naked women before. I've never seen a black factory toad woodpecker. And that was pretty much that in a nutshell when it comes to, you know, the place birds held in his life. Um, but I, I'm going to digress a little bit. What I'd like to talk about is maybe why dad might have been the way he was in many ways. He was um, very focused, very determined, very disciplined individual. And I think part of that comes from growing up on those short grass plains of eastern Montana. You know, it's west of the mountains, east, I mean, east of the mountains, west of the um, Dakotas, there wasn't anything out there. He used to say there was the only thing between him and the um, North Pole was a barbed wire fence and it was down. So, you know, dry, dusty plains. Um, his parents were homesteaders, you know, tail into the homestead era. And they ended up moving into town and running a blacksmith shop for 20 years. But dad's job um, was basically to go to school and do chores. That's what his life was, go to school, do chores. And they were poor growing up. This was the depression and nobody had any cash money. And he said, told me once that he didn't know he was poor growing up because he had food on the table and he had going to school and he had clothes and he had a roof over his head. Now the roof over his head was a homestead cabin and his room was the enclosed front porch unheated. Now this is not heated in Montana. And he said at night, he would crawl under every blanket his mother could find to pile on him, including one of those big old fashioned buffalo robes that you read about in Westerns. He had one of those and he said it was really very warm. But, you know, that, that was his life. We're talking outhouse, no electricity, pumping water, milking the cows if you wanted milk and growing your own food. And so grandma would put up all of the materials from the summer garden and she wrote a poem about dad and <clears throat> what he did while he actually did his chores now some of you may have known that dad could whistle like crazy i mean probably heard him do a lot of bird calls but did you know he could whistle like classical music i grew up listening to him do the flight of the bumblebee for example if you don't know that piece of music listen to it sometime it's incredible Dad could do it in real time, the whole thing. I still don't know how he breathed doing it. But he whistled while he worked in the best dwarf fashion from, from Snow White. So here is a poem his mother wrote. There's a boy just over the garden fence who is whistling the time all the live long day. And his work is not a mere pretense, for you see the weeds he has cut away. Not a word of the pneumonia in his task I hear. He has scarcely the time for a growl, I know. For his whistle is sounding bright and clear. He must find some pleasure in every row. But, oh, while you whistle, be sure you hoe. Yes, for if you are idle, the briars will spread. And whistle alone to the end of the row may do for the weeds, but is bad for the bread. Whistle and hoe, sing as you go. Shorten the row by the song that you know. And so, that was pretty much that. Whistle while you work, enjoy whatever you're doing, and be disciplined. And so, you know, I thought that might be a little insight into how he became who he was. The last thing I'd like to say is uh, I think that growing up in the Montana Shoregrass Prairie, where there was very little water, gave him a total appreciation for anything with water. So waterfowl, water birds, leeches, petrels, ocean, rivers. If the bird was in the water, he was all for it. And I think it was just a reaction to Montana's Eastern Plains. Another thing I would like to say is that, uh, um, you know, Tom and I met, of course, at Humboldt. Uh, and basically, you know, Doc was my, uh, um, somewhat like a major professional. I did uh, two years of uh, banding for the uh, Band Tail Pigeon Project that we did back in the uh, 70s. and. Uh, um, you know, the first time I ever met Tana was in the uh, uh, game pens. Uh, she she never had uh, um, we never talked before, and yeah. I remember the time we actually met, like three years before we actually got together, because uh, she was talking about you know somebody was just like afraid of Doc because he would 
you know, basically ruin their life if, if they ever did anything wrong. And I always had the opposite direction that uh, I was very gutsy and I didn't care if I got involved with the, you know, the uh, um, professor's uh, daughter, which, you know, every, all the other CU guys, which I was never involved with CU, but, uh, um, you know, I was a determined one that I could do something like that. And they would say, aren't you scared to actually go out the the daughter's, uh, you know, and going, no, no. I said, that that's not the way I was. And uh, so basically, it wasn't for Doc uh, and the Bird Band Project. We never would have gotten together, together because of the uh, circumstances. So mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate to have uh, a lovely uh, Tana being my partner for now. It's been 45 years <laughs> since the. Uh, when you think about it, that uh, I went to Humboldt and, and basically in uh, in '72 is when I started at Humboldt, and so it's been a great uh, um, long time you know, venture that we both have had yeah. because. You know, at that time period, what I actually did, you know, because he was a person I, I was involved with early on with birding. And he's one that really, I think, got me birding uh, early with, uh, um, you know, when I first got to Humboldt, and because I was not much of a birder before then, but I definitely became a major birder after that point because of Doc. All right. Well, great. Thank you guys very much. That's that's a it's a lot of good color. It's nice to fill in some of these, uh, you know, some of these uh, dimmer areas of Doc's life and, and stuff. And uh, that's uh, that's really that's really good. Thank you guys for 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 coming in and 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 helping out here. All right. Uh, I'm just going to go to the next person. I I don't know if he's around, but I think John Sterling has asked to speak. And uh, if he's around, come on in, John. He may not be. I, I looked, I kind of been looking through the- uh, I'm, Yeah, I looked through the list too, and I didn't see his name, but I will say that I know that he did do a big day in San Diego County yesterday. And I think they broke the record and got 229 oh. species in San Diego County. So he well, might still be sleeping, who knows? <laughs> right, well, I'm sure he'd miss, missed it. John was one of our Humboldt State students that are Humboldt, you, I guess it's university now, um, but he was one of the students that uh, really took off from here and uh, you know, has done a lot of, a lot of birding all over the world and uh, truly regards Doc as a, as a special, a very special person. He was a, a, John was a special guy to have here in this Yeah, he was the first area. person to sign up too. For this wow, that's too also. bad. He's, yeah. Too bad he's missing. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But we have, uh, the next one is Rick Williams. Is Rick Williams on board? Maybe. Well, okay, we're rolling through. <laughs> Rick had to leave early. Uh, had to, if if he was here, he was a class of '76, and uh, he he could only hang out for so so much time. So maybe either he didn't get here at all, or he had to leave already. All right. How about Donna and Doug? These are people I I'm unfortunately not aware of. So hi, Donna, Doug. We're both here. <laughs> I see that. Yeah, actually, I saw your name, so I knew you guys were going to be here. So that's great. <laughs> Welcome in. Um, do you want to go first or me? Um, we were a uh, class of 1981 for Doug and 1982 for for me. Um, one of my favorite stories about uh, Doc was uh, when we were I was on the conclave team for 1982, and while we were doing one of our conclave study sessions on the weekend, uh, we got a call, uh, Doc got a call that there was a great gray owl up at Prairie Creek. So of course we, Doc had his priorities and we all piled into his car and ran up there and got to see it, which was a really good thing we did that right then because the next day it was uh, killed by a pickup truck flying, the flying too low to the ground across the highway there. So. The interesting thing about that is what almost 30 years later, we had a great gray owl in exactly the same spot that uh, my, that Doug got to see with me because he missed that first one. Yeah, I'll, <coughs> I'll add a, a, a couple of things. And I also wanted to say, hi, Tana. Hi, Larry. Hi, Michael. Good to see you guys. <laughs> um, that uh, I, I felt 
with with Doc, I got it there in January of '78, and I felt like both he and and one of the persons who helped bring him to Humboldt, uh, uh, Charles Yoakum, were were both kind of people people with with students. You know, they yes, they they wanted you to work hard and do well, but they, but to me, I always felt like they were approachable and you could talk to them and stuff like that. And I'll, ju I'll just mention um, one particular thing for, for us after I had uh, graduated a number of years later, we came back up um, to do a Christmas count in uh, 1996 and Doc was gracious enough to, um, to let, let us stay at his house and, and help with the count. And uh, he got a little more than he bargained for on that, that we we were planning to go up and stay with him like one night, maybe uh, maybe two, and that was an El Nino year. So we got a late start that afternoon, going back uh, down to the Bay Area where we where we live. Stopped at, at Benbow Inn, and they told us, "Well, it's good that you stopped because Highway 101 has slid in front of you with the massive Leggett slide." And it's flooded behind you, so you can't go anywhere. And the flooding behind us went back down, and we we went back up to Arcata, and Highway 99 had, or Highway 299, uh, had also been severely damaged. So there was no way out of Humboldt County. So we showed back up at Doc's house, stayed around another two days, waiting for the highway to open up, and they were very, very gracious in in letting us stay. So that's one of the. Um, the big memories for uh, for me. Um, also, one other one. I, I was on uh, three conclave teams, and we had a third and an ignominious fourth before finally winning winning one. And he he never berated us for us. I'm sure he was a little disappointed for us. And I think Donna may have one or two other things to mention real quick. Well, when I was uh, dating uh, Doug here. Um, we on one of Doc's uh, field trips for cl for class where we were staying overnight at Sac Refuge. I wanted to go see Doug instead of staying with the class, and he gave me that look like a father. You know, that what do you mean? He, but he but he let me go off and do it. <laughs> so so that's everything. That's everything for us. And thanks so much for setting this up. And it was certainly a highlight to have him at our wedding. Very nice. Very cool. Well, that's that's great. Thank you guys very much. Um, I was supposed to say at the outset, and I don't think it, I think everybody's being correct about this, but uh, have your uh, mics muted, please, unless you're called on to speak. That's kind of normal Zoom zoom activity so um we'll we'll just ask people to to have your mic zoom, uh muted until we call on you um all right well the next the next uh folks that get to get to call are gary and lauren lester and we know they have had quite a quite a bit of history with doc so uh get, <clears throat> gary and lauren please take over cool gary Thank you. Um, my my long relationship with Stan uh, began at, at Humboldt State when I was an undergraduate in, in in botany and knew nothing about the wildlife department. But um, I was working with Dr. John Sawyer and. There was a program at um, Fish and Game to um, to develop these natural resource areas um, in the state, and so I, I had a, a summer job at Redwood National Park, and uh, I was interested in Point Saint George. I was interested in uh, the Crescent City Marsh, and um, also Castle Rock, and I was particularly interested in Castle Rock in that uh, at that time it was owned by um, a mining interest in Oregon. 
and somehow the the prospects of Castle Rock being um, quarried uh, concerned me, and, and so so I asked Dr. Sawyer, who should I ask about who knew anything about the, um, what was going on at Castle Rock? It's clearly occupied by thousands of 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 nesting seabirds, and he goes, well, you should talk to Dr. Harris in the wildlife department. And I go, okay. Um, so I did, and and Stan was very gracious with his time um, uh, during his office hours. And I, I, I don't know the timing, uh, but he had student Tim Osborne, who's doing a thesis. Um, Gary um, mentioned the, the, the leech of storm petrels uh, that maybe Tim helped um, band on, on Little River Rock. Well, Tim expanded that work to a thesis that, ex that looked at the offshore rocks through all northern Northwestern California, including the time on, on Castle Rock. And uh, Stan said, well, um, yeah, good luck with your, your fish and game project. And I, I, I wonder if you could um, help Tim, help me, um, to help with the identification of some plants that Tim collected on Castle Rock and that they were in a herbarium case uh, um, at the botany department, if I could help with that. And I said I would. And I, I looked at Tim's collection and I was kind of curious because the, the collection was, it, it reminded me of like, um, um, how would you call it? Uh, like alfalfa hay bales, it, it just kind of stuffed in newspaper. And I said, well, they're kind of funny collections. So I, I helped kind of neaten that up a little bit and identify those plants. And, and little did I know that five or six years later, I'd be doing the very same thing that Tim was doing, climbing off these rocks and understanding the difficulty of collecting plants coming off the rocks to say a boat, the waiting zodiac, or when I was doing the seabird uh, census off California and, and taking those plants <laughs> coming off the rock and stuffing them in my shirt. And I could see how they could end up uh, almost looking like a, a hay bale collection um, once you were, you were done. And encouraged me to take on the, the Del Norte Christmas bird count. Um, it, it had a lot of potential. Um, Stan and, and Paul Springer encouraged me to, to be the compiler um, on that count um, in 1977. I'd never participated in any Christmas count. I didn't know what it was. And that was my very first count when I compiled the Del Norte count and Dr. Springer and Stan and the students um, uh, came up to help and pushed Del Norte for the first time over that sort of threshold 150 species, which Del Norte maintained for many years after that with Stan's help and from the students that came up from, from Humboldt. And uh, we, <laughs> I, I, I had all this data and when the, the count was done and people had a nice compilation party and went home then and I'm stuck with this data. Okay, now what? Well, Stan in, invited me over to his house uh, like during the Christmas season to bring the maps and the data and he helped me compile that count and the first, my very first one. And again, I was never a wildlife student. It's, a, a nerdy botanist and he uh, he was all supportive and I, I recognized later that you know Stan wasn't always all about birds that once I began my career at um, the engineering firms in, in Eureka and remember I put together a, a, um, a wetland program well who would I ask about wetland species and plants and where would I find a make a display and why does Stan? Stan would know where these species of wetland plants grew. And 
I would just go and collect them. And I, I had the most awesome display of local wetland species and all properly identified, of course, and, and with Stan's help. And, he, 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 and then later in Stan's life, um, I was happy to share that he wanted to identify all the flowering plants in his yard. He had a marvelous yard. You just think about the, the yard birds, this, the, the worm-eating warbler wintered there, the brown thrasher, just all the amazing birds that he had there. And, but he, he wanted to photograph every flower and he invited me to, to go through the binders that, that Michael and, and he put together uh, to, to identify every plant properly and, and help add a few more. And so that was, you know, was a different yard list, right? The, 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 this, the, the plant species of, of the yard. I, I just have to, again, thanks Dan, Michael, Lori, um, uh, that at any time, just drop in to see Stan at their house. And there was like a, a, a warm lunch waiting for you. It, it didn't, and it didn't matter if they had lunch already. It would it'd be made up and there'd be bird stories to talk about and, and the yard list. And Stan would, you know, he, he, he wanted to know how, how Lauren's doing and how the kids are doing. He, he, he was just totally into the kids. And, like, I, I, and the, the, the kids love Stan. And, and here we are, we're, we're at Kelsey's now in Santa Barbara and birds out the window right now. I can, <laughs> the love of the birds and now I have being the botanist I, I am. I, I can identify the birds out the window just by hearing them. And the encouragement that Stan gave, gave me uh, is, is remarkable. And to, to, to be on the boat trips that he invited me on, again, not a student, but an interest, interested person. And all those boat pelagic trips that I got to share with Stan is, is just uh, a memorable, a conclave trip that he couldn't make because he had another trip planned for Crescent City. So he needed a leader for that pelagic trip. Well, that pelagic trip, that's where we had horn puffins and Stan still, still looking for horn puffin. You know, he's probably got plenty of horn puffins now where he you know, could enjoy, but he, sh he shared, he said, you lead the trip. And here's these people from Colorado and you, God knows where the Conclave kids came from enjoying horn puffins and, and I, I could share the photographs with Stan, and, and he, he he was very encouraging, and I'm so thankful that not not a student, but you know, a lover of birds, and, and being a participant in in the the natural resources that I started with uh, way back when. I mean, maybe Lauren wants to say a few words. I have very few words, but my. I married into a relationship with Stan. I mean, I knew of him, but not really. And he was incredibly interested in our family and interested in our life and every one of the kids. And it was just, he was, he was like a father of sorts in town and um, loved our kids and loved our family and was very interested. So that was, you know, beyond the professional, beyond the student, beyond the birds. He just cared about human beings in a really unique, meaningful, special way for years, for years, just, you know, ongoing interest. And that, that that's, was very touching. That's all. Thanks, Gary. Gary, you're on mute. Okay, well, what I said when I was talking <laughs> without voice was thank you very much, you guys, and please say hello to Kelsey while you're down there. And uh, that that was great. It brought back a lot of memories uh, of stuff. And I do believe Tim and Laurel, uh, Tim Osborne and and his wife Laurel are on. They they're going to be able to talk here in a little bit. Um, and Tim has had some incredible. You know, he's had an incredible life, but he, uh, he was he was definitely uh, 
one of again one of Stan's favorites in in that uh, he, he he's the man of nine lives. So all right, uh, Gail Kenny. All right, our Audubon president right now is next. So Gail, please take it away. Okay. Hi. Well, um, I was one of Stan's students back in the early 1980s. I came as a transfer student to Humboldt and was just thrown into the uh, wildlife scene, uh, you know, all the, the science and everything. Um, and I had him for wetlands and uh, I, was, I believe I had him for ornithology one. And um, one of my memories of the ornithology was all the fabulous field trips. And um, I remember being out in the Arcata Bottoms one day and we were all on the school bus. And um, I think he, he was standing up and somebody was pointing out a bird flying outside the window and you know, saying, well, well, what's that? And he said, well, that's a raven. And we're like, how do you know that? <laughs> um, and so that was something um, I, I aspired to and um and now i'm one of those people that can recognize a raven flying <laughs> um so the other the the deeper connection i had with stan was um i at the time i was a wildlife student i believe it was optional to do a um, senior project or not and um by that point i had learned that birds are a lot easier to study than mammals so um I decided I would do my senior project on birds and I chose Stan to be my um, uh, advisor for that. And um, he was just so um, supportive um, and encouraging. And um, it was just, just a, a very different experience um, having him be an advisor in that way than having him as, as, a, as my teacher, you know, in a class with tests and stuff. Um, so, and then I, I ended up staying, I left um, the Humboldt area for a bit and came back and got involved with the local Audubon chapter and, you know, got reacquainted um, with Doc, um, you know, out on field trips and just over the years. And um, it's just always warmed my heart um, to see him out in the field or, you know, at a rare bird. Um, so he, he's, you know, of all the professors I had at Humboldt, he's the one I got to know the most um, and stayed in touch with. So um, he's just, um, you know, as everybody's saying, he's just turned out to be just such a kind and, and warm person. And I'm just really um, grateful um, that I got to know him because, you know, I became a pretty avid birder for a while and, and I'm still, um, very into um, birds and um, conservation. I just really appreciate the education I had at Humboldt and um, being able to stay involved in the way that I am. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, I think that's what I want to say. <laughs> thanks. All right, great. G thanks, Gail. Gail does uh, an amazing amount of work um, as many of the volunteers for Redwood Region Ride uh, Redwood Region Audubon does, but uh, Gail's been, I, I don't know, I think this is maybe her third or fourth time, I don't know how many times she's been president, in the, but uh, she and Hal and a number of people have uh, really held together, and I know Doc Harris supported Audubon, especially when it first got got going and, and through its years, so uh, he, he left such a great legacy. Um, all right, the next person on the list is Jeff Todoroff. Hello, Jeff. Come on in. At least Jeff was there. <laughs> Maybe he's Head on mute. Oh, Jeff, take, Head take yourself mute. off mute, buddy. Yeah, I did so. Um, well, I, I came very late to the party, and I didn't. Well, my profession was veterinary medicine. And it wasn't until my son came home from a conclave trip and was talking about this trip and all the things they did on it. And I said, ooh, I got to give me some of that. So in 2003, I took a sabbatical for my work. 
came up here and took a number of classes. Of course, Conclave was one of them. And really enjoyed myself and started running into Stan's name and hearing him spoken of. I'd never met him uh, until I came back around, well, five years later and retired up here. So I was around the wildlife department quite a bit. I think it was a wildlife wannabe pretty much, but the, uh, uh, I still hung around Conclave enough and I got to uh, uh, sort of take over teaching you know, the duck wing identification part. And uh, I really enjoyed that. So one day we got Stan in to come give that talk, which was fine with me. And so I got to see him in action anyway. And uh, this box of wings, and he was throwing these things that I always carried. So, you know, and say, oh, here's how you understand this, now you get that. I thought, huh, okay. But figuring he probably got many of those wings that you can do it that way. But a few years later, and, and again, I met him back and forth. I was learning to bird too. And I'd see him and Michael at that point uh, on V Street Loop several times a year and you know, run into the Clop Lake. And always pleasant, always enjoyable, always some insights. And, you know, I'd be sitting there talking to him and he'd be watching, what, a pair of gray foxes sunning across Clop Lake. And, you know, I hadn't even noticed them. So he's pretty darn aware. And eventually I got to where I, I thought, I really, the more I, I heard and learned about Stan and Lori too, she was pretty legendary. Her apple pies were legendary for sure as well. But um, I really need to get to know him a little better if I can. And by then he was, he was in heart failure. Uh, so I went up to the house and I stuck a flash drive with some bird photos in it that I've taken. I'm just starting to take bird photos as well and figured, oh, what the heck, that ought to work, and it did. And he and I spent several really enjoyable afternoons with a flash drive plugged into his TV, looking at different bird things. I uh, finally got, and I got my, uh, my copy of uh, Northwestern California Birds autographed by him, so I was really pleased to have that. And, and I told Michael this a number of times, and I do mean it, that uh, as an, a now aging father, He's my hero. I mean, he is really a hero. So I'm all kinds of props to you, Michael. I hope my son can do half as well. <laughs> but the, uh, and it's like, well, what do you get to appreciate somebody who's, who's done so much for so many? And I didn't know, but I think the best gift I could have given, which is one I did, is I brought him a brand to eat. I was still hunting in those days. And it actually turned out to be one of the last brands I ever harvested. But I had it all fixed up and stuffed with rosemary and celery and cooking directions on it because they really need to be treated right. And I do so hope he enjoyed that. So I enjoyed my, my brief meetings with Stan Harris. I envy you folks, your careers with him, your education under him. But is a pretty marvelous fellow. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jeff. That's that's great. We're 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 pleased to have him have my Jeff's migrated from uh, from the Dakotas. I forget north or south, but anyway, he's he's uh, his practice was there, and then in San Francisco for quite a while. But we're pleased to have him in our neighborhood. He's a he's a great addition to the birding world up here. So, all right, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, next, we have uh, Deborah Schlafman, please. Deborah, are you there? I'm here. You said it right, too. Thank all you. Right. Well, the <laughs> Germans, you know, you got to stick together. Jawohl. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Welcome in. Thank you. It's really uh, great to be here. And I really hope that uh, we can, when we can get together, we can do this again in person because I've got, I'd like to share so many stories, but um, I was one of Doc's, I think his last cohort of grad students. So, um, and I am forever grateful uh, because I am the person I am today because of knowing him. Um, he had a lot of sayings, 
So, um, but I'm not surprised Eric brought up the one that I was focusing on, which was don't let your schoolwork interfere with, with your education, because that really hit home for me when I first got to know him. I'm like, and I heard that, like, that is crazy. This is coming from, you know, larger than life, uh, you know, ex, you know, major excellency professor in at Humboldt, uh, and and yet, um, you know, I um, he took it to to truth, and and those are the things I learned from him. Is I you know learned a lot from the classroom work, but. Um, it's the stuff that um, he really also excelled at. And uh, so I wrote a few of those things down. Um, how to be generous. He is, was the most generous person I know. Um, how to have fun. It's not hard. Uh, being genuine. It's the best way to be. How to pay attention and truly, truly listen. Um, belly laughs can be had anywhere. The, important, the importance and the benefits that come from an open heart. Um, and basically just how to be a better human being. And those are the things that I take from those are the things that he gave me that uh, have made me a better person. So looking forward to meeting you all in person. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. That was, wow, that was delightful. From the heart, I'm sure. Yeah, Doc, Doc was such a treat. Um, I believe the next person is Ellen Clark. But I, I don't. I haven't seen her is listed. It, is Ellen? Are you there? I am. I put it as Ellen Henwood because that's who I used to be. <laughs> Understandable. That's okay. <laughs> oh, good deal. Oh, well, welcome in. Thank you very much, both of you and Thank your you. husband. There. Nice to have you guys here. Thank you. So I'm going to read this here. My notes. Um, I'm Ellen Clark. And back in 1976, when I transferred to Humboldt from UCSD, I was Ellen Henwood. And when I arrived at HSU, I did not know anyone. And I chose HSU because I could study birds and it was the farthest university from San Diego while still being in the state. So basically I went on a blind date and I didn't visit the school and I didn't know a soul. And the farther I drove from home, the more I began to question my decision to attend HSU. And when I got there, I did what I was supposed to do, and that was to contact my advisor, who just happened to be Dr. Harris. And the meeting wasn't as I had expected it to be. I was used to the UCSD professors who didn't know their students, and nor would they give you the time of day. And when I went to go visit Dr. Harris, he explained the program and then he asked about me and my goals. Um, what would I rather do if I wasn't going to study the birds? And we took it off. We took off on a few tangents there. And by the time our meeting was over, we were laughing. And I think he sensed my homesickness because he told me to give Humboldt a little time. So fast forward, six months later, it's a gorgeous spring day and out in the quad and I see Dr. Harris walking across and he yells out, Ellen Henwood, how are you? I, I couldn't believe it. How did he remember me? And let alone my name, since, since I fast forward a little more time and I was finally enrolled in his classes, uh, the upper division classes and he was teaching wetlands and waterfowl and so did Dr. Yoakum. And it Oops. it was also a Thanksgiving dinner at a little town that was on the way north on the five, and we were going to go do that. We were going to stop at the um, for dinner after our day in the fields and the Sacramento Valley, looking at birds. 
And after that day, after traipsing through the wetlands, watching hundreds of birds, everyone was pretty darn hungry. And there was at least 60 of us, if not more. And we stood in line um, for our dinner, cafeteria style. And Jim and I were towards the end because we were last and we found a seat way across the side of the room. And we just about ready to dig in and we could hear all these people yelling. And it was as if a celebrity had walked into that room. And Dr. Harris was carrying his tray of food and the students were yelling out, hey doc, did you see that bird? I saw a lifer doc. Hey doc, here, come sit over with us. I mean, it was as if, as if somebody like Paul McCartney or Mick Jagger walked into the room and he keeps walking. He looks around the room and he sees our table and he's going to sit with at our table and he sits right next to me. And I'm thinking, oh, good. Now I have to remember every bird I saw by genus and species. And he scoots in, he sits next to me and he looks over and he goes, I've been thinking about this meal all day long. And there was so much laughter at our table, we, we could hardly get a bite. And we really didn't talk much about birds at meal except for the turkey. And the next day we were driving up and just outside of Reading, we hit snow on the 299. And the big yellow school buses needed to put chains on so we all had to get out. And when Dr. Yoakum and Dr. Harris got around to the side of the bus, they were like two little boys. And I don't know who threw that first pitch, but it was like game on with those snowballs. Well, I graduated from HSU. I went on with the Forest Service, the BLM and the Park Service. And I eventually found myself in education. And I taught at UCSB for a while, but I ended up settling in teaching elementary school science. And then in 2003, our oldest son was getting ready to go off to college. And I started reminiscing and I was able to get a hold of Dr. Harris's address and I sent him a letter and, and I told him how much I loved those days. And, but that I actually learned more than just what he taught in class. And I told him how much it meant to me when he remembered my name as he walked across the quad. And that because of him, I made it my life goal to remember each of the names of my hundreds of thousands of students so that they would feel the same way that I felt when Dr. Harris remembered my name. And his legacy, it's not only his extensive dedication to birds, his students, his family, and his community, but also to the lives that we continue to touch from the things that we've gained from him. And to me, Dr. Harris, he really is a rock star. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tana. Fabulous. Thank you, Ellen. Very nice, you guys. That's. Uh, I'm. I, I didn't take doc. I didn't take any classes. I had better sense because I wanted to keep my my grade point average up, kind of where it was. So. <laughs> but uh, you guys that actually took took the took the classes from doc and uh, and stood the test of time that's that's great and you're right uh, i think that uh, he touched so many people and it just filtered down through the masses of people that they touched um, and that's why he's, you know that's why we're here today that's why we're memorializing him because he was pretty special pretty pretty special guy uh, sean McAllister, are you there sean Maybe, uh, maybe not. Okay, well, you come back if he comes, shows up. I know Cindy is here. So Cindy Moyer, please come in. So my story is very different from everybody else's because I started um, birding, you know, 10 years ago as an adult. Um, and I first met Stan 
on uh, one of the Saturday morning marsh trips, which I was going to every single week because that was how I was learning. And the Sten experience was really different from what I had had before. First of all, it took us, I believe, an hour to get from um, the parking lot at Clop Lake to the corner where the um, Avocets usually hang out. Um, but more than that, um, instead of telling us what we were seeing, Stan um, grilled us all on what it was we were seeing and um, what bird we were looking at and why was it that bird. And fortunately, I had been going to enough of these by then that I actually had a clue. Um, but yes, it was quite a different experience. And um, as I got to be a better birder, um, I remember being out at the marsh one day looking at green wind teal and listening to this little peeping sound. And um, I wasn't a good enough birder to know that that was the ducks yet. Um, but Stan came by and I asked. And at that point, he told me he couldn't hear them, but he made the sound for me. And I was like, yes, that's it. So compliments of Stan. I know that, that they make that adorable little peeping sound. Um, and once he eventually knew that I was employed at the same institution um, where he taught, he would always stop um, when he saw me and asked how things were going in the music department, even though that was not our bond at all. Um, so even though I didn't have nearly as intense a relationship as many of you did, you know, he contributed to my learning um, and I'm super grateful. Okay, well, thank you. You caught me. I was I was checking the the list of people here to see if um, if Sarah Keller was was in the audience. I'm here. Oh, fabulous! Hey there. Well, good. All right, welcome in, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was at Humboldt from 1976 to 1978 as a biology transfer student from UC Berkeley because I wanted to be outdoors more than I wanted to be in a lab. And I had to put up with the standard conversation from the first wildlife management class of, uh, you know, you're not going to get rich doing this. What are you doing here in this class? Um, I assume those of you that were students also got that same talk. And then I got the other talk about, well, you're a girl. So there was that. What they, I didn't get that from Doc and I didn't get that from the professors, but you'd get general sense of that too. But um, I took wetlands habitats, ornithology one, and what was called ornithology two uh, at the time from Doc. And I wasn't the best in the class, um, but I loved the work and I loved Doc's wry humor. We had the best field trips where he would tell stories and crack jokes. And it was just compelling and adventurous and we, because we never knew what we would see. It was always exciting. Um, lots of teachers like to have their lessons planned and he would just go with the flow and write it. And Doc Harris helped me get my professional start as a wildlife biologist by writing a letter of recommendation to the Forest Service for a summer job in 1977. And I got that job, thanks to him. And that led to uh, another job once graduation in 1978 uh, was over. Um, he wrote me another letter of recommendations and le letter of recommendation and Two weeks after graduation, I was landing in Cordova, Alaska as a wildlife biologist for the Forest Service, same institution. Uh, my uh, job was located on the Copper River Delta, which those of you who are birders know is a magnificent wetlands area, a really important stopover point on the Pacific Flyway, not only for spring migrants, but also for fall, uh, for shorebirds, waterfowl, and sandhill cranes. Um, it wasn't just bird work there, but botany too. So my wetland habitats uh, work was really put to good use then. And so I thought of Doc often. And his life took me further into Alaska. I corresponded annually with him. And to my delight, he wrote back, um, adding personal notes you know, about the family to Christmas letters. And it became a tradition. And I, I still have those letters. They're, they're a real treasure. I'm now retired from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, but I found that birds of the world class or advanced ornithology or ornithology two, you know, whatever you wanted to call it, bore up over time as I was able to go birding in Europe and Costa Rica and New Zealand. And I remember when I was in Costa Rica in oh, 2015 or something, I, I saw whatever type of trogon it was, I don't remember now, but 
um, shame on me, but I was so excited I had to immediately write him and tell him that I'd seen this bird that leapt out of the pages of our textbook from our Birds of the World class and, and into real life. It was just astounding to me. And he must, I mean, who knows what he thought about getting a letter like that, um, but I was pretty excited. <laughs> so Doc was a pivotal figure in my life. Um, I'll never lose the love for birding nor my strong interest in wetlands. Um, I'm grateful for his encouragement and even his gentle teasing that pushed me to work even harder. He was kind with a huge capacity to teach his students and his enthusiasm was absolutely contagious. In case in point, I last visited him with Michael in 2016. I had my younger daughter with me and we all visited together the Arcata wetlands and there unexpectedly, he gently coached Allie in how to identify a mallard. Uh, now, Allie is a type of kiddo who's not especially prone to know or care about birds and certainly sees it as fodder to tease her mother. Um, but he could teach where her mother had failed. Um, two days later, she and I were up in a hotel in Portland and she looked out the window upon, she goes, mom, I think that's a mallard down there. Look, here are the field marks. That really touched my heart. Doc had a gift. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much again. Doc, we've got just, this is so nice to have so many, so many of, of Doc's, you know, grad students and past students and, and, and just friends that, uh, that have come here. Um, Brian, Melinda Barton are next on our list. Thanks, Gary, I appreciate it. I'm trying to start the video here and it's not where it is. Um, I really appreciate it. It's great to see all of our friends. And, and I wanted to first off give a special thank you to uh, Michael. Um, it is recognized just what Michael spent and, and what he did for all those years for Stan and, and CARE. And um, in, in CUAA and the Alumni Association, we talk about it all the time. And, um, and I just want to, it's a special thank you from the alumni to Michael for everything he did. We really appreciate it. Um, I noticed in the chat that, that John Carlson was not able to make it tonight. Um, on behalf of John and, and the Alumni Association, I wanted to say thank you um, also. And to let the group know that uh, CUAA is planning a tribute to Doc. Um, if you wanted information, it's a shameless plug, but you can go to the CUAA website and take a look um, uh, at the uh, scholarship we're trying to put together in Doc's name uh, on, on behalf of the alumni. So um, on a personal note, it, I um, Stan was my mentor. I still to this day consider Stan my mentor. Um, we always, I always wanted to be um, accepted with Stan as everybody else said he was very very hard and his classes were hard. And I look back and they were the hardest classes that, that I had in my college career. But I remember to this day, the, the day I knew I was accepted and it was on the Sacramento Wildlife Refuge field trip. We'd gone over, we birded all day. We went out to dinner in uh, Gridley, uh, finished up at Gray Lodge and we were headed back to Sac Refuge to camp. And Doc always would get a half gallon of ice cream and two spoons. And if you were the lucky one chosen, you got to sit next to Doc and share the half gallon of ice cream, the Rocky Road ice cream, and eat it all before it melted between Gridley and Sac uh, National Wildlife Refuge headquarters. And to this day, I remember the trip I got to go on and, and Stan went, Hey, you like a uh, Rocky road. Come on, sit up here in front. You can, you can share it with me. And, and, uh, I reminded Stan of that many, many times over the years, um, and how much that, that meant to me. So, um, anyway, that's, I just wanted to say, thank you. It, it was, in fact, actually the last story real quick, uh, Melinda's with me and, uh, actually Stan, uh, Melinda and I got engaged. I asked Melinda to marry me, um, at Conclave in Montana. And, um, and Stan actually knew that we were engaged uh, before our family or any of our friends did. We pulled Stan aside and said, oh, by the way, I just want to let you know this is where this is going. And uh, you're responsible because we met in your class. Um, and it, it's gone full circle because our son now is a senior in the wildlife department at Humboldt and is um, 
focused on ornithology as well. So it, uh, Stan doesn't, I know Stan understood, but I know a lot of other people that you have to understand just how he touched all of our lives, our professional lives and our personal lives. There's Humboldters all, as you said before, there's Humboldters all over the world, so. Um, yeah, I just um, have to add to what other people have already been saying that um, he was he was someone that I feared also. He was terrifying when I first met him. I only had a couple classes with him. He was not my advisor. And um, um, I know that I also really got to know who he was through other people and cohorts that um, I was involved with. Uh, one is Chris Reland, who did a lot of taxidermy work for um, the the birds that were done there, and um, Kevin Ward. For those of you that remember him, um, he was a bus driver for many of those trips. Those, and, and I would hear stories about Doc and the field trips from Kevin before I ever even experienced one, and. Um, so I had a lot of, of um, expectations about Doc before I really experienced him personally. And he certainly lived up to each and every one of those and exceeded them most of the time. Um, and also reiterate, you know, how much he, he passed on to other people around us. Um, he's a legend to friends that we know. <laughs> never even knew Doc, never knew about Humboldt, and they'd be out birding with us, and we would pass on information that we had experienced about Doc, um, things that we learned about him, our kids knew, know about him, um, maybe meeting them once in their life, but um, they know who he is, uh, what an incredible birder he was, and an incredible man that he was for um for those of us that have known him and the professor at Humboldt. So there's no one like him. Thanks and thanks Gary for, uh, for putting and, and, and all, all of you for putting this together. And, and we do hope to do it in person someday, but, but it is wonderful to be able to do this and, and be here. We're honored to have been invited. Thank you. Well, you're more, you're more than welcome, and thanks for thanks for attending. And I, I do want to say that I, I have very little to do with this other than having my computer on. Uh, there was a lot of work behind the scenes, like I said, uh, and Michael uh, and uh, Michael Harris and uh, Rob Fowler, Gary Bloomfield uh, did the heavy lifting, and uh, I'm just the pretty face. So, well, thank you uh, as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, you guys. Great thoughts. Um, all right. Well, we're rolling on. I think our time is doing pretty good. Uh, we've got Tom Lescu lined up next. So here we go, Tom. Okay. Nice to see everyone tonight. I met Stan before I began birding. In 1973, my geography professor at HSU assigned a project to prepare a mock EIR to assess the idea of bringing Alaskan crude oil through Humboldt Bay. When I volunteered to do the wildlife element, my professor promptly directed me to speak with Doc, so I sought him out in his office. I quickly realized that his knowledge of all things avian, especially relative to Humboldt, was encyclopedic. I did my best to furiously, furiously scribble notes that made some sense while he answered my questions. I never had the pleasure of being one of Doc's students, but when I started birding in earnest in 1987, he was always there to share stories of his travels and research and to illuminate some of the ecological habitat relationships that makes one a better birder. To weigh in on my and other folks' rare bird sightings, and when I served as the voice of our local rare bird alert, which of course was pre-bird box, to thank me for turning my records, the birding community's collective sightings, over to him. In 1995, as we began work on the Humboldt County Breeding Bird Atlas, 
he was always there as a source of info and much encouragement. 34 years after the birding bug bit me with memories to last a lifetime, among the sweetest memory concerns finding my own 400th species for Humboldt, a third county record pygmy nuthatch. Knowing that Doc had yet to see it in the county, he was the first person that John Hunter and I called to be able to give something back, share with Doc two, two pygmy nut hatches in the same field of view was a thrill I'll never forget. But the biggest debt I owe to Doc is this. In 1992, when he was on the cusp of being, being the first person to see 400 species in Humboldt County, uh, this impending milestone was so noteworthy that I was moved to write an article for the Sandpiper. That article rekindled in me a love for writing. Little could I have foreseen that this would result in me writing more than 160 columns for the Sandpiper, as well as having more than 30 articles appearing in various literary and scientific journals. Thank you, Doc. And uh, Michael, thanks so much for the remembrance of of Doc, the uh, teapot here. That's it. All right. Very good, Tom. Yeah, hold, Tom, hold the duck up completely. So the rest, so you can see the audience. So Michael Harris, uh, while he was taking care of Doc uh, in the la latter part of the time there, uh, decided to uh, busy his hands a little bit. He's an artist in, in many ways. Uh, photography, of course, is his his favorite thing but uh he made and correct me if i'm wrong michael but i think he built he made about 135 of these or more uh of these teapots all different not all different species but a lot of different species probably 20 species or something like that and uh the if we were to hold this uh in person he was going to be able to hand one to each of Doc's grad students. So Tom, you're, you're not even a grad student. I don't know how you got that. Of course, I got one too, and I'm not a grad student either, so. But anyway, thanks, Tom. That was really good. Uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate your, your contribution there as well. All right, the next one, John Dunn. Man, John is, uh, of course, world-class birder, but definitely one of the ones that's been very important to California birds for quite a while. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting John when he was like 16 years old or 15 years old <laughs> when he found a, a black-headed gull out in front of our shack when, when we lived out at Jacoby, Crack, uh, Jacoby Creek. So John, welcome in. Thank you, Gary. And thanks for the lodging on your floor I don't know many don't remember how many nights um, but uh, it was considerable and you were ever so kind and gracious it was always a pleasure to see you um, I sort of I had an introduction to Humboldt County it's kind of I thought of it as the land of rain um, and some of the winter trips was seemed nothing but rain and it was easily a decade or so or the better part of a decade before I met Dr. Harris. And, um, but I certainly knew much about him through many long trips driving from San Diego to Humboldt with Guy McCaskey and heard about the litany of what had gone on in Humboldt. I probably heard more about the, the red pole shot by one of his students than any other single story from Guy. Um, I think I was at Dr. Harris's house looking and missing worm eating warbler and met some of his family, but he might have been away. Um, there might have been a Harris the sparrow there too. And I can't remember if I saw that. But um, mainly, I knew I met Dr. Harris. Do you know, happen to know, Gary, when he retired from teaching? Uh, Mike would be the, the best one to ask about that, but I believe it was uh, in the late 80s. 
That's when I think it was. Well, I was, I've been leading, I say 1992. So I, for, oh, 40 years, I've led tours for wings. Um, mostly North America, but my favorite junket of the year in the winter is to go to Thailand, Southeast Asia. Then I was doing Malaysia too. And when Dr. Harris retired, he came on our wings trip to Thailand and Malaysia. Now, I had heard some that he was a taskmaster and a very tough instructor. But I remember from what a lovely three weeks we had together in Thailand and Malaysia. He was a consummate gentleman. He was a devoted student then and wanted me to teach him as much as possible about Asian birds. It might have been his first trip to Asia. We had very many nice evenings. He told me about growing up in Montana, the big snowstorms that would hit the Eastern Plains. And uh, he, I showed him a lot of Asian birds, many of which he found himself. And remember thinking what a just a thoroughly decent and enjoyable person he was to be with. Um, I didn't see him too many times after that, uh, mainly through Michael generously bringing him, bringing him by. I remember struggling, many of us trying to get him on the black-tailed gull that was there in March. I think I saw Dr. Harris. It was March 11, 2018. He, black-tailed gull was a new bird. The bird was there. We had to get him up from the wheelchair and try to get the bird in the scope. He was typically gracious, ever so kind. Sorry about being a bother. I think he saw the bird, but um, probably Michael would know better. And then the last time I saw him, we had a WFO trip that I led with, um, uh, Rob was the principal leader, up to Humboldt and uh, Del Norte counties in 2019. And on the 1st of July, <clears throat> we met um, Dr. Harris, Michael brought Dr. Harris by <clears throat> the oxidation plant at um, there in Arcata. And that evening, uh, he came by for dinner. And I, there's a photo of me having dinner with him. And Kath Ann Lynch, who helped engineer the meeting, gave me a copy of her, of uh, Dr. Harris's book, the second edition, I believe, which is now out of print. I have the first edition in a box somewhere, which is yet to be discovered. I may be in a, a comatose condition when it is discovered by someone else. So the number of meetings we had were relatively small, but I remember each of them and the man I greatly respect not only only contributed to ornithology there, but the number of people that I've run into that have nothing but enormous respect for Dr. Harris and how he has influenced their lives. And I'm very grateful for that. And it's an inspiration to us all. All right. All right, thank you very much. That, that's great, John. Uh, if you guys don't, don't know, John uh, is the editor for the uh, National Geographic uh, book uh, of birds. And uh, so we, we owe him uh, thanks for clarifying a lot of issues along the way for, for, for us. Um, all right, well, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, by the way, uh, he, Doc did get to see the gull. I think Michael maybe put that into the chat, but uh, yeah, I think I was up there with you, with uh, Doc and, and, uh, and Michael, and we, we did get to, see the, get to see the gull there. All right, uh, Kyle Sproggins. Are you around, Scott? Yeah, I am. Yeah. All right. Welcome in, and thank Alrighty. you very much for 
for being here. Yeah, well, greetings from uh, Olympia, Washington. Uh, my name is Kyle Spragans. Uh, I never had Doc Harris as a prof. Uh, however, I was fortunate to get several guest lecture doses during undergrad. Uh, the first was with uh, during Dr. Mark Caldwell's uh, ornithology course, uh, the pelagic trip on the Coral Sea, and Doc Harris at the front of the boat with binoculars in one hand, pointing the directions for the captain to go with the other, and the two-second ID of a distant speck, uh, and then shouting out, okay, what was that? Pig-footed Shearwater, and everybody looking at each other just dumbfounded. Um, the, ne the next was during Dr. Jeff Black's waterfowl course, and the Wings Lab, uh, Jeff Todorov mentioned uh, the memorable Wings Labs because of the wing specimen being whipped around the room as Doc Harris kept everyone alert and learning the details of North America's duck wings. Uh, and finally, during, during Dr. Jim Lyons' uh, wetlands course, the first time that it had been taught since Doc had retired, uh, and Doc Harris giving a nine lab guest lecture, <laughs> AKA half the sem semester, uh, but most notably the epic field trip uh, with, with the, that semester's waterfowl course uh, up to the Lower Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge, Thule Lake, the Lava Beds National Monument, down to the Modoc Plateau and then home. Then with the nightly tally of the master bird list, and the tossing of suspect second observations uh, that weren't validated to Doc's standards, uh, and thoroughly schooling the thorough schooling of natural history field journaling, which to this day I can visualize uh, Doc's steely-eyed evaluation of my poor attempts to capture the appropriate technical descriptions. Yet his echoing words of wisdom, which Eric and Deb both said already, "Don't let your schoolwork get in the way of good education." Uh, when I returned to Humboldt uh, for under for my graduate uh, work, I was a privileged recipient of the Harris Scholarship that helped me get back on the waterfowl track as a profession, and uh, was even more privileged to get a chance to interact with both Doc Springer and Doc Harris to pick their brains about waterfowl and wetlands. Uh, and as an aside, many graduate students have been helped and will, I'm sure continue to be helped along the way by the Harris's uh, through, through that important uh, scholarship, that important support. Uh, but, but while I and many uh, immediately think of Doc as synonymous with, with Humboldt State, it, it was not until I left Humboldt that of a, a couple of experiences made me realize how broad Doc's influence was, is, and will likely always be. Um, the first was in uh, 2012, uh, as, as a newly hired waterfowl biologist for the Yukon Dash, uh, Delta National Wildlife Refuge in Western Alaska, uh, I got to spend time in an area that had a deep uh, history of monitoring and research. Uh, it's referred to, to by locals as the church, the last remaining building of the traditional site of the old Chivak village, uh, the primary region of the Chupik Alaska natives. But it was 50 years before that, that Doc Harris documented a detailed accounting of waterfowl nesting along the Kashunik River, including some of the few documented stellar eider nests on the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. And getting to boat that same stretch dozens of times that summer, reading Doc's natural history account uh, brought overwhelming chills and a sense of pride uh, uh, to have that connection, uh, that deep history connection. And second, and now most pertinent to my current job as the waterfowl section manager for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Doc's fundamental descriptions and insights of the Columbia Basin prior to the irrigation project. These descriptions provide some of the only pre dam descriptions of wetlands and waterfowl in this phenomenal waterfowl flyway highway, uh, providing important proof there were indeed waterfowl prior to 1952. And one of the only descriptions of cliff, cliff nesting Barrows Goldeneye uh, in central Washington. So thank goodness someone was meticulous enough to write this stuff down. Just as a, another reminder that the natural history descriptions, the ability to get one's hands dirty, and the first hand looks on how critical to embedding that true meaning and value of something like wetlands and waterfowl conservation and management. Um, I'm am exceptionally indebted to this passion that Doc Harris passed on. Uh, 
uh, even just in a few guest lecture encounters. And I can only hope to strive to keep these fundamentals, these fundamentals forefront in our waterfowl program here at WVFW. So thanks to Doc. Thank you to everyone for the opportunity uh, to allow me to share a few, few memories. Uh, and, and most importantly, for the stories that, that folks are sharing tonight, this is, this is a great insight. So thank you very much. All right, Kyle. All right, very good. Excellent. Well, I hope everybody's uh, hanging in there. Uh, well, the next person up is uh, a person we owe a lot of thanks to for uh, helping get this together. In fact, all of Godwit days, uh, he's been an anchor for for uh, all of us uh, over the years for any artwork we needed. But Gary Bloomfield, please come in. Okay, thank you, Gary. Hi. Oh, okay. oh, sorry, just a minute. <laughs> just turn it off. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to mute for a quick second. Okay, they're 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 gonna get it together, I'm sure, any second. Okay, how's this? Perfect. Is this working? Yep. Yeah, it's working well, great, Gary. Sound? Welcome, welcome you and Jane. Yeah. Okay, how's this? That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Of course, I have to be the technical difficult, difficult one. <laughs> Technically difficult. So anyhow. Giving Sean a nightmare. <laughs> so anyhow, I, I first met Doc when I came up to Humboldt as a freshman in 19, 1980, fall 1980. And... He was, you know, I was, I was already a birder, and so, you know, I, I was directed to Doc Harris, you know, you know, to, as the person to talk to about birding in in, in Humboldt, and so I uh, showed up in, at his office, and you know, had a, a great you know discussion with him, talked about. It. I saw the, the the black and white photo of the snowy owl on his on his on his wall, and yeah. And, that was a whole discussion. I was like, "Wow!" And so, uh, wide-eyed, I said, "When's the next one gonna come?" <laughs> well, <laughs> I had to wait a few decades, but <laughs> and but anyhow, that was how how I met him, and and I actually I I only had a couple classes from him. Uh, I actually wrote my own major, and and he, it was in, in basically scientific illustration, and. I had an advisor in the interdisciplinary studies, but Doc was my unofficial advisor, and and I actually even wound up, uh, you know, doing my senior project for for my major under his direction as working on soft part coloring for some museum specimens, which is something that Lori you know used to to do a lot of, and so that was a another really fun fun connection. But that. Yeah, you know, and I also took his museum techniques class, you know, which is what led to led to that in part. Yeah, that was that was fun. I don't remember if he was the one who said. Anyhow, I remember about one of the projects for that. I had, uh, did a, uh, I did disarticulate and clean a, a black crown night heron skeleton, and you know that was that was kind of fun. It was. Yeah, luckily the the Jolly Giant Commons let you check out pots and you know cooking gear at the time, and so yeah, that was made a little easier. Oh, and, and and so that and also I was involved in con, in conclaves since my very first year at Humboldt. And the first trip in spring of '81 was to Tucson, so I mean that was a fantastic you know experience you know getting to. The bird Madeira Canyon with Doc and the whole group. You know, we all went down there for for some night birding, and, and then uh, another also. My probably the highlight of my HSU experience was Orny Two. You know, taking a, and that was, you know, 
I remember I was probably, and also when one of my my academic achievement I'm most proud of was earning a, an A minus from Doc in that, <laughs> and and also the other another thing was, of course everyone who, who ever took that course you know it's you had the the famous Tule Lake lava beds trip, and that was. And that's another yet another one of Doc's legacies because that that trip has become one of the the Godric Days post post festival trips that we do annually now, and so that's yet another one of his. Yeah, and let's see. Um, yeah. Oh, another, another thing was, uh, I remember traditionally, uh, I would always, uh, you know, at first accidentally and then deliberately, I, th I suppose at some level, always have to be, never have my data finished for the Centerville bird count at, <laughs> at the evening sure. compilation. And so I would have oh. an annual visit with Doc and I would deliver my data to him Do after that. Purpose. And that was, that was always a really fun, fun visit to have with him, you know. And I remember one one time having to, you know, one of the early years having to do a write up for a black capped chickadee on that count because it was the first one ever found on that one. And now now they're everywhere. So, and uh, one other one of the more re more, re more recent memories was getting a chance to um, share, you know, seeing the lifer of a. Uh, the wood sandpiper down at Centerville Beach, and you know, thanks to Sean McAllister and Amber Transo, who shuttled Doc out there on a, an ATV, and then I got to share scope views with you know, with, with Doc to see the sandpiper. Another thing, I'd like to let Jane, uh, you know, say something too now. Oh, about, okay. Um, well, I married into birding uh, almost 30 years ago, come this July, so. I was not a birder, but my father had been a birder and a very active. I think was as a rebellious teenager, I went into theater and sign language and, you know, ran away from that. But really, I came to Humboldt State because I wanted to be outdoors and I wanted what I wanted and it was still, it was in me. So I remember Doc's first words to me were, I wouldn't be doing this job if it weren't for my wife, Lori. And she's not necessarily the quality of birder I am, but she encourages me to do what I need to do, when I need to go, to allow me to go on these trips. I, and he just kept saying this to me. I'm like, why is he saying this to me? And it was because he was giving me marital advice. Basically, <laughs> you've got to support your partner in what they do and what their passions are. And he could see that Gary had unconditional love for me. And I, and, you know, we would talk about stuff like like marriage and and my disability. I I've been really disabled for thirty years, and through all these surgeries I'd have, he he come up and, and say, "How are you doing?" I say, "Oh, fine, everything's fine." And he would always go, "No, how are you?" <laughs> you know, really tell me. And then as Lori became more and more disabled, he would take her out, and then Gary and I would meet and um, join them as as she could through her body. And it was like she and I had a very close relationship too. So there wasn't a doc without a lorry. And um, I'm sure that all of you know that and you've, you've all alluded to her cooking. So I, you do know that, but it was more than cooking. It was just, they were like the couple that you want to grow up and be married like, <laughs> and what you want to aspire to. Um, he, He'd be so proud of me for finally going through his triple scoliosis surgery and standing up straight and being able to walk again. I mean, I know that he can see me. I know that he feels, I, I thought about him as I was going into surgery. I thought, what would Doc say? He'd say, you go for it, Jane. Do whatever you need to do. Keep yourself active. And he was always like that for me personally. So no, I wasn't a student. I was, I was a wife, but to him, I was a friend. Yes, and Laurie. Mm. I miss them both. Wow, I do, I miss them both. Mm. Oh, okay. So. 
All right. Well, great, you guys. Thank you. Thank you both very much. That, that's yeah. very nice. That you know, they're very they were very humanist. The you know, both both Stan and and Doc. Uh, you know, I still make Lori's pie dough. You know, she uh, she turned me on to you know the way that she made pie dough, and and then of course Doc said I taught her how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you guys very much. All right. Uh, oh boy, uh, Mark Higley. Somebody I haven't gotten to talk to for a long time, a very valuable person in our community, helped early on, especially with the uh, with the Marsh Project and then the Breeding Bird Survey. He was a he was a heavyweight with that. So, Mark, nice to see you again. Yeah. Hello, everybody. You, you have to turn your volume up or something. Before. Yeah, not not loud enough, Mark, for some reason. I, I'm not sure why, but I can hear you, but you're way in the background. Is something maybe covering up your microphone? Um, no, it seems it should be working. I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, that's that's hard. That's too bad. I. Uh, just speak loudly and everybody le lean in closer. <laughs> um, here, let me give you some advice. Um, go to the little microphone down on the bottom left of your screen. There's an arrow next to it. Click on that arrow and then click on audio settings and that will give you volume control for your microphone. Is it any better? Yes. All right. We've got you. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good, Mark. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, um, I didn't prepare any actual stories. I've been listening all along and everybody's covered a lot of things that are, you know, typical doc. He was such a wonderful person and his enthusiasm for birds was so infectious to his students. I remember my first ornithology lab transferred over from Shasta College, and I thought I knew birds. And when he said, um, you know, what, what's your birding experience and what's your life list? And, and I told him what mine was, and he goes, well, you haven't seen hardly anything yet. But the fact was, the, the ones that I had seen, I knew well. <laughs> and from that point forward, I just, I buckled down and, and learned from him. Um, I spent the decade of the 80s as a student at Humboldt. I transferred over in 81 and finished my BS and then started on my master's degree. And for some silly reason, I collected data for two and a half years before uh, completing my field research for my thesis. And um, Doc let me do that, but then he was a little impatient with me getting my thesis done. And when I finally handed it to him, close to the end of my time limit, he, um, he said, well, it meets the, the, the weight criteria. And I go, you mean the, the length of time it took to, for me to get it to you or the heft of the, the item? And he goes, the heft of it. I went, oh, great. And I, I was thinking, okay, now I'm gonna have um, a week or two at least, if not a month to relax and not have to think about my thesis after dwelling on it for so long. And he said, yeah, um, that sounds about right. And he called me the next day and had me come pick it up. And he had scribbled something on every single page and it was 120 pages long. Um, I don't know how he did it, but his grad students got a lot of attention and he didn't mess around when it came to editing and getting thesis back. And that can't be said for every um, professor. I know that for a fact. <laughs> um, I also, because I was there for so long, I was TAing ornithology and got to go on the Orny 2 bird blitz multiple times. I think I, I did six trips um, when he, before, before he retired. And then I also did six trips 
after he retired where it was just Dr. Reidenauer and myself and, and he and a few uh, other guests now and then. Larry came on one of them, it was really nice. That was a good trip. Um, he loved those trips and it really is an amazing place that we live. Humboldt County is just so rich with birds, but then you drive inland and see all those different habitats. Um, truly, he, he made those field trips a learning experience for everybody. And I, I gotta admit, I got to share the ice cream with him a number of times. And on one particular trip, um, I was a TA and I, I got my own ice cream. I got a, uh, just a pint of Haagen-Dazs chocolate chocolate chip and I was prone to migraines and I ate all that ice cream and I got a migraine in the middle of the night that lasted most of the next day. But um, during the night, I walked up to the, the bathrooms at the Lava Beds campground and there was a, a sawwood owl catching moths by the, the lamp. And so I went down to the, the campground and got Doc up and we got sawwood owl on the, the bird list for that year. So at least I did my part even though I was sick. Um, I felt very honored that he invited me to go on so many of those trips. I don't know if you know what it's like, but he doesn't invite freeloaders. You have to work and earn it or you don't get to go. And I remember the description um, of the trips ahead of time when he was talking to the class that you had to beg, borrow, or steal all the clothes you could because it was going to be cold. And I think I've been on three or four of them where it actually snowed while we were out camped at lava beds. Um, really wonderful trips. I hope that Humboldt still does that sort of thing. Um, it made me want to participate as much as I could for doing labs and things at Humboldt as I've been working at Hoopa now for, it'll be 30 years in May. Um, I've had a lot of field trips where I invited classes to come out to, to the reservation and, and um, basically trying to do what Doc taught me, uh, let kids get hands on in the field and, and see stuff. Um, I think with that, oh, one thing I wanted to say is, um, I remember back when Mike, Michael and he were building a house and he was so proud of that project. Um, I can't remember when that was, but it had to be in the eighties. Um, and then how proud he was of Tana and, and Larry as well. And um, I don't know if you know, but the only two bird blitz almost always in the later years occurs on Mother's Day weekend. And somehow um, I remain married to my wife. It'll be 40 years this June. And I think it was because I would take her over to Doc's and we would sit with Lori and Doc and have a good time. And, and Lori would tell her that that's the way it was. So. Anyway, I miss them both tremendously. Thanks for letting me speak. All right, great, Mark. <laughs> That's good. I'm, I'm pretty sure you were talking about the, the construction of Michael's house. Doc's house was was already there, but uh, yeah, I, I know. No, that's, that, that's exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought so, because uh, it was he was extremely proud to see Michael's house you know, rise, rise up there. And Michael has done a fabulous job with it. It's uh, I was just in it the other day to pick up some auction items for, uh, for our, our, our auction uh, that we're going to have for Godwit days uh, at the end of the month. Anyway, thanks, Mark. It was, it was great to see you and, and great to have you, you know, participate. Good, good to have you here. All right. Uh, Jane, you've been in the, in the, here for a long time. Jane Hicks, please. Hi, Gary. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. And I'll keep it kind of short. It's getting late. And I know we still have the slideshow coming. Um, so I was in the last cohort of grad students with Deborah Schlafman. And I just would like to express my huge appreciation to Doc for taking me on as a grad student and encouraging me through the to the finish. I made the mistake of doing an aquatic invertebrate study. And so not only did I have my, my field seasons, I had about 2000 jars of bugs to pick afterwards. And so that was quite a chore. 
And then, and then after I finished, he was such a good friend and advisor, you know, and, and well, for the rest of the time. So, so I met my master's open so many doors for me and I'll just forever be grateful to Doc and, and Lori um, and Michael for all the support they've given me. So thank you. Well, that was, that was short and sweet and very sweet. Thank you so much. Uh, that's great. Yeah, we are, we are kind of moving into the time, but I, I we're doing okay. We're getting down the list here. Um, it, is Cynthia Fisher on, on board here? Cynthia, are you around? Maybe not. Um, she, she was going to speak, but um, I see her name listed. Uh, if you've been in Doc's house, uh, that Doc and Lori's house, you know that uh, Cynthia Fisher was very well represented. Her artwork uh, pretty much was emblazoned all across their, their room. Uh, she did a lot of wonderful African stuff that uh, Michael ended up with some of it, and I'm sure Tana got some as well. But uh, anyway, too bad Cynthia's not, not here, but uh, she had a great relationship with, with Doc as well. Um, Archie, Sue, come on down. Good to have you guys here. Can you unmute, please? I guess we're unmuted, right? Yes, you are now. Thank you. Good oh. to have you here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually was well, a couple of years older than Stan, so I'm going to go way back. Um, we were neighbors in Sunny Bray. Uh, our houses were just a short distance apart, and um, Stan and I both taught at Humboldt State. And we both love to hunt waterfowl in South Bay, uh, South Bay of uh, Humboldt Bay. And we'd hunt from the stake blinds there and uh, shot mostly scop, lesser and greater scop. Uh, we had many good hunts together. Um, we both taught at Humboldt and at the, in those days, Stan, everybody, all the males wore suit coats and proper, shirts and, and a tie. And Stan, of course, as you've already heard, always wore a leather tie on the exam days, which I suspect uh, frightened the daylights out of people who weren't prepared for the exam. Um, Stan stayed a, was and stayed an ornithologist. I gravitated to mammalogy. Uh, among the things I remember, Stan got me and others to help Banned birds at night on Camel Rock, and uh, we had we walked out when the tide was low, and hopefully it, was, it wouldn't have a storm come up. And we'd be able to walk back, and we all succeeded in doing that. We put up up uh, mist nets on the rock, and as the birds came in to to go to their burrows, why they got caught in the mist nets, and we banded them. And then the rest of the night, I remember I went to sleep with my feet hanging over a cliff, leaning back against the the side of the thing went to sleep that way. Um, Stan, so a lot of other people also went on those banding trips. Stan really built up the bird collection in the HSU museum and he, and that I think many people are aware of that. Uh, we had many good times together. We miss Stan and realize, but realize if you family members miss him a lot more and our thoughts are with you. Sue, did you want to say anything? Um, no, I think Archie said it all. Thanks. Oh. But I, I, I just want to say that it's just been very heartwarming to hear all the, um, all the wonderful things that that people have said about Stan, which, which is just such, such a testament to what a great man he he was. All right. Well, good. Good to see you both. It's, it's good great. To see, good to see here. some of the old, uh, not so old compared to us, um, <laughs> former students, and um, and to and and actually to meet his students that we've never met before. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> nice well, to good. see everybody. Thank you for having us. Oh, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Uh, so you probably remember the smell. Archie, the you know when when you're up there and you've got those 
leeches petrol flying into the into the nets the first thing they do of course is throw up and they blew a, a kind of an orange oil out and it gets on everything and uh once you've got that smell on you you know it i mean and you're not going to get that smell out it's it's something that you know stayed in the clothing for for a really long time but I, I didn't know that you had done that. That's you get you just you just rose even that much higher, Archie. Good, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> Great to have you guys here. All right, this is wonderful. All right, Ruth Rutzel. I think you're here still with us, aren't you, Ruth? Maybe she had to leave. I had to unmute. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Okay, good. Welcome in. Hi. Oh, it, this has been so wonderful, and it's wonderful to see a lot of my old classmates as well. Um, I graduated in 1982. Um, I took Ornithology 1 and Wetlands and Ornithology 2, and we all remember that wonderful lab final. Oh, my God. <laughs> so to this day, I remember that. Um, I just wanted to say, Doc changed my life. I mean, I, I just pure and simple, like everybody else that that has talked tonight. Um, I was going to be a mammalogy major. I was going to do marine mammals. I was into birds a little bit, but those classes really changed me into the avid and crazy birder I am today. Um, and I've spent a lot of my time since graduating driving up to Humboldt to chase birds, and I was so happy to see Doc and visit. I remember uh, we went up to see the brown thrasher in, in the yard and I had not called ahead and I was there with my birding partner Peter and Michael came out and invited us in and we had such a great time because Peter is really into Native American baskets and so was Lori. So they spent a lot of time talking and I saw uh, Doc's wonderful uh, paintings and art collection of birds, including the infamous Labrador duck. Um, and most of you know what I mean by that. Um, he also gave me advice on my love life. He said, uh, you can't help who you fall in love with, but don't let that ever deter your love of birds and nature. And I've always kept true to that. Uh, my spark bird happened to be that great gray owl that was up at Prairie Creek that sadly was hit. Um, but I, that's my favorite bird of all time, even to this day. And I just, um, the other thing was uh, Arcata Marsh was just in its infancy when we were there. We helped out planting plants and I did, in my senior thesis was actually doing bird surveys there. I worked in uh, the city of Petaluma for um, many years and they decided they wanted to do a tertiary marsh. So I was able to clue them in to contact Arcata so they could get that going. And today we have this beautiful Ellis Creek project in Petaluma. This is in Sonoma County for those of you who don't know. Um, and you know, I remember those days birding there with Doc and all the students and what, what a great influence for the future that was. And um, I really, really miss him and Lori too. And uh, it's so nice to see you guys though. That's it. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice, nice to have you here, Ruth. Uh, yeah, Petaluma is, uh, we just cruised through it yesterday. It's, it's really got some nice, some beautiful birding areas and uh, that's one of them for sure. All right, uh, Eddie Pausch. Eddie, are you there? I think I saw your name earlier. Can you? I am. I don't know if you can you hear go. me. Can you hear Eddie, me, Gary? Yes, I got you. Very good. Come on in. Well, well hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Gary, and everybody else for putting this together. This is, uh, this is really nice. Um, I... Uh, Fortunately, was right at the tail end of Doc's uh, teaching career and Archie. It's great to see Archie and Sue. It was wonderful to see you. Um, I, I'm a, a 92, 
I graduated in 92, so uh, kind of there at the tail end. And I'll, I'll just keep it short. You know, I was fortunate, I, counting Conclave in uh, my senior thesis, I was six classes with Doc. So it was a treat. And uh, yeah, all those, uh, all the trips, pelagic trips and the trip up that everyone's talked about, you know, 299 over to five up to Thule Lake, uh, dancing with the cranes, dancing with Sandhill cranes. I had never done that before. We all danced and that's something I try to share with everybody uh, still today. Uh, I got to dance with the Sandhill cranes. Um, so, um, and I just, yeah, one other thing as he's all changed our lives. Uh, I have the career today I have with the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, kind of some of the stuff Eric alluded to before, but uh, I know uh, graduation week, one of his former grad students called him, had a change in his biotech, dropped out and needed someone. And uh, Doc Harris said, call Eddie. I know he's taken a job with Forest Service already, but give him a call. And uh, I switched gears that last week and have worked basically for Fish and Wildlife ever since. So. Uh, I'm forever indebted to him uh, for the career I have today and the passion we all have for conservation and, uh, and birds around the world. So uh, just thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to being able to do this all uh, together, perhaps in person in the future. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Eddie. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you've looked at the chat, but uh, Michael uh, put on there that he really has got He's got all these duck teapots. And if you're interested in getting one, uh, please, he put his email on the in the chat area. If you're a grad student, that's who he made them for. He made them for Doc's grad students. So um, if you're interested or if you're taking part in this, you know, and if, if he's got enough ducks to go around, I'm sure he'd love to, you know, to get you one, you may may help them out and send them the money for the postage. I, you know, because the postage could get pretty expensive, expensive. So you might at least offer to do that for him. But uh, great, that that was really good. Uh, Spencer Holmes, you've been here. You've been hanging out for the whole oh. time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good evening, you're, everybody. You're first on my my list here, so welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, and good evening to everybody. Um, I was uh, also a 90s uh, uh, student of Docs. I, uh, 1990 to 95 is when I was there. And I was fortunate to have the museum techniques class, uh, wetlands, and, and also going through the, uh, the conclave classes as well. I'd been to a couple of those. And, and it's amazing how snippets of conversation, you know, keep coming up, but they've been like burned into our skulls and, and, uh, you know, in the technique techniques class, uh, I was working on a northern fulmar, and you know, I brought it up <laughs> to Doc, and what, what do you think? And he's like, "What is that?" And uh, northern fulmar, and I uh, go, "No, that's a B fifty two bomber. Uh, you're you have overstuffed it." And uh, I, so I've always had this regret. It's probably still in a drawer somewhere there, um, and. As uh, Eric and Deborah and Kyle had alluded to earlier here, uh, and it has really stuck with me. Um, I, I've been a high school science teacher for the last 20 years. And uh, when Doc also, you know, had mentioned to me, don't let school get in the way of your uh, education. Um, you know, admin comes and goes, programs come and go, uh, acronyms come and go, you know, oh, this year we're doing TAPL, everybody needs to TAPL. Right. And I, I don't even, for the life of me, I don't even remember what that is, but it's it's the the students and, uh, you know, the teachers that, you know, just make it so much more of a fantastic uh, profession. And uh, I'm fortunate to have a large garden that I've worked uh, at my school. And, uh, you know, with uh, students setting that thing up and we've got ponds and and, you know, birds, amphibians and reptiles raccoons poop in there that's that's to the extent of our mammal experience um and insects as well and um uh that is just a place where we can go and you know put down your pencils close the books let's get outside and that i've gotten the feedback from students that that is such a memorable 
thing. And that's what has made their high school experience uh, exciting as well. So. Um, the, and then uh, just finally, the, uh, the only relationship <laughs> information uh, I, I have to share because uh, um, I, in uh, 1991, I came to Doc. I, he was the first teacher, uh, professor that I had confided in that uh, my girlfriend at the time and I were expecting a kid. And uh, I was terrified. I'm sure I was gray and I, you know, like, now, this is the middle of college, and um, he very, very supportively <laughs> replied and said, they just figured out what causes that, and uh, <laughs> he just, you know, uh, he was great, and um, we had visited up, uh, you know, Arcata a number of times over the years, and always the open door, and and uh, just really wonderful uh, experience, and I'm, I'm honored to have known him and been a student of his. I try to take darkness and apply it uh, in my classroom as well. And uh, we're loving to get outside. And that concludes <laughs> what I got. So thank you. All right, great. <clears throat> thank you, Spencer. Where do you teach? I'm at uh, Heritage High School in uh, Brentwood. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. and. Huh? I teach four sections of entomology. So shout out Jane, a lot of work with vials and insects and everything. And, um, <laughs> and then living earth, which used to be biology, uh, but is now sort of a stripped down model of that. So okay. yeah. thank right. you. Real good. Great, wonderful. Well, again, great. This is great stuff. I, I, I love it. Um, and I'm sure everybody hey, else is. Yes. Hey, sorry to interrupt too, but um, I neglected to put Mark Caldwell on the list. So I told him that he could speak before me. So Mark, if you'd like to come in and say something, feel okay. free, sir. Uh, I'll let Gary make sure he's through with everybody else before I speak, if that's okay. Okay, uh, actually, uh, there's a uh, John Carlson. Are you there? Is John Carlson in the audience? He may have had to go. So I think uh, Tim and Laurel Osborne are also waiting, but uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead and then we'll get Tim and Laurel. All right. Uh, wow. <laughs> I just can't uh, express how impressed I am with the impact that Stan and Lori had on the lives of so many people. And, you know, I wish I could say hi to all of those former students and community members that I'm looking at now who are looking back at me and just uh, say thank you for what you've shared uh, with regard to Stan and Lori. Uh, personally, I came to Humboldt in 1989, uh, right at the tail end of Stan's career here. And um, I think he had a pretty big role in me getting hired as a tenure track professor. Like, I'm not supposed to know that, but I, I'm pretty sure that he weighed heavily in my hiring, and I owe him a lot. Uh, as a faculty member, we're evaluated in three areas, uh, those being teaching, scholarly activity, and then service. And De uh, Stan excelled in these areas. I, and just listening to folks talk about the role that he played in the various classes and as an advisor is a testament to his uh, teaching uh, credentials. So in the area of scholarly activity, Stan published a, a fair amount. Uh, as, a, as a faculty member, plagiarism is a bad word, but I'm gonna claim plagiarism in all the good sense of that word in that I copied much of what I did as a teacher, especially from what Stan did in the short time that I had to share with him in the field. I went on those field trips to the SAC refuge. I copied him in the reviewing of every bird that you saw on the field trip, no matter how long, if it was a weekend or a day or whatever. Uh, so those things crept into my teaching and they were uh, effective. Uh, Stan's 
work in service is certainly exemplified by the no name pond at the marsh and other roles that he played in the community. So uh, Stan is, you know, certainly going to be remembered for a long time by a lot of people. Um, and I know that the wildlife program, most of you are on because you have some connection directly to the wildlife program that he represented for a good five, he spanned five decades from 59 to 92. And uh, the program is still strong and field oriented, albeit in this pandemic era. Uh, and that's still a credit to Stan. So personally, I'd like to thank the family uh, for agreeing to allow us to memorialize Stan in this way. And uh, there's probably no person who's more strongly influenced my career than him here at Humboldt. Uh, it's good to see everybody uh, sad in this way, to have it be that the death of somebody who is so uh, honored and revered is, brings us together, but it's also uh, pleasant to see everybody. Thank you. All right, Mark. That's great. Say hello to Tammy for us. <laughs> uh, we will. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, maybe Rob, if you don't mind, I'm going to introduce uh, Tim and Laurel. Yeah, that and sounds good. Just a short story about Tim and Laurel. Um, I came back to school here in 1970 and uh, one of my friends that I'd met in 64, 65, when I was here earlier, was this guy, Tim Osborne, who, as Gary Lester talked about, had um, was doing a master's uh, thesis by that time on the offshore, the, bur the breeding birds on the offshore rocks up and down Northern California. Uh, and he was living in this little red shack out on the bay and, uh, Anyway, he and he and uh, his girlfriend at the time, but then future wife, were getting ready to go to Africa, and I was lucky enough to be the next person to take over that shack. But uh, so anyway, I, I know Tim and Laurel pretty well, and here they are. Please come in, Tim and Laurel. You guys there? Unmute. I just brought them up to be panelists. Yes, no, yes, we're here. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Hi, Tim. I, I don't see ourselves, but anyway, um, for Kyle Bear, by the way, um, for Kyle, um, here's um, oh. a book. This was written actually by an adopted father of mine when I was living in Galena in Alaska. So that's uh, kind of interesting. But we first met. Um, Let's see what's happening. Start my video. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, here we go. Okay. Here you go, Kyle. <laughs> there you are. I recognize that book. But um, anyway, um, you know, to get things going here, I first met Stan Harris in 1964 when I went to Humboldt State. And my friend and I, Galen, were busy trying to trap all the mice we possibly could in the area. So we went out to Little River Rock and there was all these holes there. So we set a whole bunch of mouse traps for the mice and didn't catch anything, but caught a couple of dead birds, brought them back, showed them to Stan. And he said, here, um, those are forktail storm petals and, and they were leeches storm petals. So we can go out there and we'll try ca catching some. So we went out with Fred Zylemaker and myself and Galen and Doc Harris. We set up our nets and we asked how many birds we we're going to catch. And Stan said, oh, five or six, maybe if we're lucky. And they started flying in. And then all of a sudden he says, oh, God, I got a migraine headache. I can't take it. And I took some pills and passed out. And we'd never taken a bird out of the mist net before, a ring bird before. We, you know, we, we weren't licensed or anything like that. And it was trial by fire. <laughs> so the end, of the end of the story was that that night we had about 350 petals abandoned. And finally, Doc Harris woke up and said, you know, what's going on? And there was a few birds left for him to ring. So that was pretty good. And then um, from there, we, you know, I actually was fortunate. I never took a class from Doc Harris. I was one of his very few students who never took a, or any class. 
or anything else. Um, I kind of hope there's leather tires in the museum that with all the bird specimens, actually, that'd be nice. But uh, he was my major professor for my master's thesis on seabirds. So anyway, yeah, we have fond memories of Humboldt back then. By the way, um, Archie, it might be nice to see you if you're still on board, I hope. Um, last time we saw Archie, we met him in uh, Kasani in Botswana, just by accident. He was uh, at the bar there and so are we. So that was kind of interesting. Here we is, Mark, Archie and Sue were there. Hi. Hi. Tim. Good Hi. to see you, Laurel. Good to see you. Really good. That was to a see long you. time ago. It was. You were going to, um, weren't you going to Zimbabwe to see the um, solar eclipse? Yeah, in Malawi. Uh, yeah, that's there. right. Yeah. It was the 2000, I mean, 2000 solar eclipse on the 21st of June. It was one of the longest solar eclipses around. It was like almost five minutes long. But that, yeah, as people probably have gathered, um, we've had a, a variety of, of trips. We've been off to Africa, spent a couple of years there, came back, um, did some, uh, maybe four years there, I guess. Came back and, and, and found, went up to Northern California. I worked for BLM at, at uh, Cedarville. And, uh, but it was kind of, we found California was dull and boring after Africa. So we had talked to Stan Harris about that. And he said the two places in his life that always had a lot of impact on him was Africa and Alaska. So in the middle of winter, we piled into our car and drove up to Alaska and it was 40 below and camped out and, and ended up there for 20 years, 20 years, 20 years and then retired 23 years ago and decided to go back to Africa. <laughs> so. But now we're back in Alaska. So in July, we came We're back done. here last We're July. We're home. So after 23 years, but. Hmm. Where in Alaska are you? We're in, um, We're in Anchorage We're now. In Anchorage right now. It's so good it's to have you back, Tim. What's that? It's good to have you back in Alaska. Thanks. Oh, you were legendary out in Galena. Yeah, it was um, interesting looking at tonight looking at all these uh, students who were, you know, they had no clue who you were or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> we're so old. <laughs> yeah, we're the old timers, basically. Uh, other than Archie there, he's the only one older than we are on tonight. So well, it's been kind of interesting. Yeah, a few words. Oh, I just wanted to say I was struck by how many people felt the same way I did when I started thinking about what did I remember about Doc and Lori? And it, the main thing was that many times we would be driving around Arcata and I'd say, where are we going, Tim? And he'd say, we're gonna go see Doc Harris. And I go, what? We haven't even told him we're coming. He says, okay, we're going. And we go and we chat and Lori makes some nice food and she laugh. Her laugh was so contagious. Um, and Mike and Tana would be there and it would just be a kind of a refuge and a place of, of support that we would go to regularly. I mean, probably every couple of weeks, we just pop in. And I think that was real important to us to have them there. And thank you all for this. All right. Yeah, well, thank a little, side, little side note there. Gary was at our wedding and that was, uh, it was 50 years ago, last November. We got married in Ferndale, California. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> hey, we won't go into that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. It's good to see you guys. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be in touch now. Th Laurel, yep. thank you for sending your email address to me. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. Okay. All right. And and now, uh, Rob, I think you're the you're the closer unless you've got anybody else up your sleeve. Yeah, is there, before I say anything, is there anybody else that would like to say anything or type a message or raise your hand um, if you decide you have wanted to say something or you just thought of something that maybe you want to say? You've got two um, people in the attendees who have their hands raised. Oh, really? Okay, let's see here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Attendees. Okay, there we go. 
Let's see. Do you want to show the slideshow and allow people to talk over this? Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, let me find these people and then let me start. I'll just start the slideshow here. And you can uh, just unmute people when you're ready. And then we'll click on. Whoops. Hold on there. Sorry about that. One second. Wait. Let me just to the top here. Okay. View present. And autoplay. Let's do five seconds. Loop since we're kind of starting the slideshow late here. Okay. So let's see here. So uh, Galaxy S9, would you like to say something? I'm allowing you to talk here. Uh, this is Slater Buck. I think this is me, Galaxy X9. At least that's what I've told on for these Zoom calls. Don't want to steal any thunder out of the slideshow, but this has been an amazing experience with a lot of amazing people. And there's so many great experiences, with Doc, but just real quickly, two of them. The first is academic, and that's, I was fortunate enough to take his wetlands management class, and what everybody says about being a hard taskmaster is incredibly great and incredibly on point. But when I walked out of the class, my feeling was, you know, he did such a good job at that, that you could actually walk into a federal job or a state job or a county job right afterwards and have a really good grounding of what it would take just from the boots up to work on wetlands. And that actually happened to me a couple of years later. And I can't tell you how many times I ran back to those notes and had the incredible experience of that knowledge that really helped me a lot. And that has stayed with me all these years, even through retirement in some of my volunteer work. I have hearkened back and looked at my notes and, and work with that basic knowledge that Doc was so good at giving everybody. And the other experiences, it's just been absolutely amazing is that if you ever had a chance, and this was alluded to earlier, to go to a conclave with Doc and be in the same vehicle and experience birding, it was absolutely amazing. Um, there's probably not enough adjectives. It was infectious, it was intense, and yeah, it was actually magical. And in one of those experiences, the first stop after a long day of driving was actually at my mom's house in Woodland Hills, California. We crashed out on my house and um, got up the next morning, walked out, and there was a flat tire in the car. And his dog was fi fixing the flat tire and we're all participating. He said, what do you know about the birds around here? I was smart enough to know about the spotted dove, which is in the tree in the house across the street. And then he asked me about parrots. And I said, well, I don't know. I've never seen a parrot around here. And about that time, two flew over the house. And so that taught me a lot right there. So it's been great catching up with everybody. It's really amazing. Um, a lot of good memories. Hopefully we can all get together and, and do it in the future. Thanks very much. You're it, Rob. You got to unmute. Rob, Rob's got to unmute. Okay. Sorry, there, there uh, looks like there's uh, Carol Ann Hagel that also wanted to say something. So Carol, you're live if you'd like to share a memory here. And just to make sure people aren't, people can't see the, are just seeing the slideshow, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, you can just great. see the slideshow. Okay. okay. All right, thanks for letting me talk. Um, uh, a nod to Mark and Slater. I came to Humboldt State because I wanted to get you know, a hands-on education. I certainly got that. And I think Doc epitomized that kind of an education that, you know, you really learned by doing. And, um, but I think my biggest takeaway was um, just being able to sit down with Doc. Um, I, I worked for him in the museum and helped him organize some of the specimens that came in. We had a bird, bird egg collection that had been donated and it gave us a lot of time to just sit and talk about life. And I remember meeting Lori for the first time. Um, he looked out of the windows of the 
museum there and you could see the parking lot below and she was walking into the building. He said, there comes my sweetie. And uh, she would come up and bring him his lunch or whatever. I, but she would, she was a regular. And more than, you know, at long after he was a professor, he, he and Lori were friends and um, he had a great deal of insight and wisdom into just life and how to deal with, um, you know, pretty much whatever life could throw at you. And I heard all kinds of stories like Lori's waits a lot birds and some of their experiences in, you know, in his travels. And I think what was most infectious though was, <laughs> I love this picture of the, the crane dance. Um, you know, he loved life, he loved people and he loved to share that love with others and it was infectious. And um, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to meet him and get to know him. And um, you know, that just made my stay, there's Lori, um, made my stay at Humboldt so memorable and so special. Um, and Doc was definitely at the pinnacle of that. So, um, you know, uh, it's good to see everybody and thanks for giving me the opportunity to share as well. Um, and I'm glad that we got this chance to, to, to come together around um, a person that was so prominent in our lives. And uh, Mike, I'll see you soon, I hope, as um, soon as we get sprung loose from this. And I, uh, I definitely gonna head up, head up to, to see everybody again. So thanks a bunch and, and thank you all for putting this together. Well, thank you so much, Carol, for sharing that. That's like everybody's just, man, it's such a special event and memory to just hear people share their memories of Doc, you know? I mean, it just kind of puts it really all in just full perspective of how important of a man he was to everybody that he, he touched lives so many people. Yeah, absolutely. Thank so, you, Rob. Yeah, thank you. Um, so look, looks like we got uh, Carol McNeil. Hey, Carol, how's it going? Looks like you want to say something here. So go ahead. Carol, you there? Hi, hi. Well, hey. this, this is a surprise, but I'm just thrilled, thrilled to have the opportunity to speak uh, uh, about Doc. And I knew Doc way long after all you guys. I knew Doc through the marsh and through his book. And and I remember a little story of the side about running into uh, Matt Walsh at one occasion. And I just, just, you know, had nothing to do with birding. And I asked him a birding question. And he says, well, let's look at Doc's book, which he pulls out of, I think, thin air. And, and we look up in the answers there. And after that, I always use Doc's book. And Doc himself, I'd run into at the marsh and he would say things like, I just saw 22 wood ducks over. And I would go out and look and I would not find one. But it was just a thrill. Every time I ran into him, you know, we could sit and talk and um, he'd look out and I, he'd just be sitting on a bench and we'd say, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm looking at that fox over there. Only time I ever saw a fox at the barge was Doc had spotted it. And um, just such a thrill to know him. Um, and I'm so, so glad I, I, he was a part of my experience here in Arcata and knowing, knowing uh, Doc and my birding experience, he's just a huge part of it. Blessed to know him. That's so awesome, Carol, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for saying something. It's just so great to just hear everybody and see everybody say, you know, how much he meant. 
and uh, and thank you. Um, it looks like we had one more person here. Eric, did you want to say something else? Eric Nelson, looks like you had your hand up. Um, oh, I just to... I was kind of a finger slip, but watching these slides, I saw a picture of uh, Dr. Springer on one of the lava beds trips, and he went on a number of trips with um, oh, the, the sack field trips and such, and I remember one time we were coming back from uh, the Butte sink and we stopped at a 7-Eleven for something and I was, I was the bus driver and Dr. Springer comes back and he's got a dog. <laughs> and Doc Harris looks at him, he goes, Springer, what are you doing? He's like, well, I found this dog. He was, he was in a box by the door. I couldn't just leave him there. So Dr. Springer takes takes the dog for the rest of the trip. And, you know, he was, he had their, they had that dog, he and Virginia had that dog a long time, but he and, he and Doc Harris had a unique relationship and it was, it was a lot of fun to watch. They were, <laughs> they were, uh, they'd get on each other about different birds and you saw this, no, you didn't. And they were just, they were kind of a pair to draw to. So anyway, that made me, that photo of, Doc Springer made me remember that story. Thanks. Yeah, right on. Thank you, Eric. Uh, sorry about having the cursor in the photos there. I moved it out of the way there. Um, and there's uh, Ben Murphy. Uh, ben, you said you wanted to say something. Can you raise your hand? And uh, we'll call on you here. I allowed him to talk. So Ben, you're welcome to speak. Oh, OK, cool, cool. Ben, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, there you are. Yeah, I hear you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm Ben Murphy. Um, <laughs> um, it's so great to hear. I, I'm, I'm in Perth, Western Australia, and um, uh. Um, between jobs driving buses and that's how I got introduced to Doc was through but well yeah well I was lucky to to drive buses and I just wanted to say that it was so great to be able to to um, hear a glimpse of people's stories about Doc and I see the slides and the slides are great and I just wanted to put myself on record that uh, here can you can you see that there um Oh, it's backwards. Anyways, those are videotapes from Doc's retirement that I did um, just before I moved. I migrated to Australia. And I don't know how, I feel partly bad because I wanted to share this with Doc. And each time I went to the house, I couldn't get the machine to work. And, um, uh, but I just want people to know that I have these videos of you, of a lot of you of you. And um, uh, I'd like to be a part of kind of whatever happens, but it's hard from such a long distance to be involved. So, um, but um, I just, just a little bit, just a bit for, for me on Doc is that, because um, as people have covered so much, I could say, yeah, ditto, ditto, ditto. And um, it's been really hard um, Doc touched us in so many different ways, and he touched me. And it wasn't really till hearing, till till months later that he had passed away, that it started to sink in how much he had interwoven into my life, um, let alone everybody else's life. That's why it's so special about people sharing. I haven't even been able to say my see, make my apologies to the family for for Stan's passing, but it's been it's been hard because I go out and I'd rather be outside showing you some of the birds around our area, the big trees that I'm surrounded by. But we got a bit of a bushfire going on at the moment. It's pretty choky outside at the moment, so um, I'm so I'm inside rather than outside. But um, 
I just wanted to share that it was just, it was great. And I'm so glad that um, I got to work with Steve Thompson, who some of you may know, um, um, up doing seabird work up in Alaska with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, just before I was about to go down to transfer to Humboldt from Fullerton College, um, Steve was kind of talking to me about um, oh, what I was going to do next. I said, oh, I'm, I'm about to, to transfer to Humboldt type of thing. And, I'm, and probably sooner, no sooner I'll be on the bus down to, to go to Humboldt. I said, well, when you're, if you want to learn about birds, if you want to learn more about birds, go meet up with Doc Harris. And that was probably some of the best advice I, I got. I probably would eventually probably would have met him through classes as a student there. But the first thing I did when I got into Arcade, I didn't even have a house to, to be in or anything. And um, I went in and found Doc in his office in the corner there of the, the building and uh, said um, that I'd worked with Steve. And he said, if I wanted to learn about birds to come see you. And, and he wasn't, uh, I, I work at the University of West Australia and I've been around a lot of professors and stuff like that. But Doc is really a, a one of a kind. And I walked into there and um, I ended up working for him in, a, in his office. And just looking at the rare, because I've seen your guys' names, looking at the rare bird accounts as they're coming in. And sometimes I couldn't quite use read, read bump writing out of his notes or, or people's notes, but I, I saw a lot of the names. And so it's been nice to kind of see some, some faces and then hear people's thought because uh, he was special to you, you, you folks that have shared, he was special to, to you. Um, to, to us, to me, I get a get bit confused with this because it's, he was more than just a, a teacher. He is a bit like a father in different ways. And um, um, he, he touched us in a number of ways. And so um, just the kind of last thing is that, well, he introduced me to Aldo Leopold and raise your hand if you're influenced by Leopold and Doc, <laughs> yeah. And then the last time I got to see Doc, which a couple of years ago, um, it was hard. It was hard because he knew he, he, he lost his lorry. And, um, and he knew he didn't have much time left. It was hard, but he was he, so perseverant. And I'm lucky I got this book. There's a couple other books I would have liked uh, out of his library, but this book by, uh, it's, um, um, Richard Botzler's book on ethics. And I remember when Dr. Botzler was kind of working on it. And, and sometimes I think, well, what's the one thing I took away from, from HSU was ethics, environmental ethics. And, um, but as I've had time to think about Doc since he's, he, he's passed, he lives on and it's more than environmental ethics. It's, it's deep in here, really is. So, um, um, and it's just touching that I just got back, uh, I, um, I've gotten involved with a Bush University down here in Southwest Western Australia called uh, Now and Up. And um, the last thing I just wanted to share that if I, if I won the lottery, I would have, I would have gotten a bus, I'd get a bus, Doc would be on Terry Roloffs and, and a lot of our different teachers that we've, we were, we were lucky to have there at HSU and just go around touring. And that's one of my favorite things. I drive buses for the university and I, and I, I work with kids and, and I love to be on buses, but their doc's a big part of that. He influenced that, that part of me. And it was so nice to hear how he had influenced others as well. So, um, and I was just thinking about this weekend as we were looking, learning about Noongar culture and, um, and, and, and talking about loss, and 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 you don't tend to name Nungars don't name the the folks when they've been lost, but Doc was right there. It would have been really nice for him to have been sitting around that campfire with us. So um, I'm gonna miss him a lot. Okay, so so I, I've tried to be short, but um, we could say a lot about Doc, and I, I look forward to hearing more of what people share online or however we do it, and know that I have this video. Um, and um, I'd like to contribute somehow. So, so thanks, Rob, for very much for and Gary for everybody for kind of ha helping this make happen and, and for your patience listening to me.
Um, 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 yeah, I'll miss him. So thank you. I'm done. I'm done. Rod, you're still muted. So Gary and Rob, can I just say one thing about um, about Stan Harris? This is Alex Stillman. And, Hi, Alex. Of course you can. Okay. So my first introduction to him was Tweety. So when I'd come into the city hall when we were working on the Arcata Martian Wildlife Sanctuary, we were just going to see if we could get it. On the walls, there were all these papers, and there was Tweety, and there was Fishy, and there was Blue Eyes. And that's how they described themselves when they were working on the, the, um, the trying to get the Marsh project going through the state. So it took me a long time to meet Tweety. It probably took me maybe uh, four or five years before I ever met him. And so I just wanted to share that because that was my first experience of, um, I mean, later I met Bob Gearhart, who was Blue Eyes, and I already knew, um, jo um, I already knew, um, oh my God, I can't think of his first, well, anyway, Fishy. George Allen. Thank you, George Allen, because he had come and talked to us, uh, the council, when I first got onto it in 72, about how he was raising salmonoid in a combination of sewage and seawater. But it was, a, it was quite an experience to see those fellows really make what we have today, the Arcata Martian Wildlife Sanctuary. And I really thank them all. And I thank him, Mr. Tweedy. Uh, cool, Alex. That's a cool story. I, I didn't. I never knew he was called Mr. Tweety. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I don't think they called him Mister, but there was tw there were there were just you, we were told don't touch the walls, don't touch yeah. anything, and that's how they def uh, referred to themselves. A little <laughs> humor, so cool. a little humor, and all that work they did for the city of Arcata. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Uh, 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 Tim, did you have something else you wanted to say there? It looks like you raised your hand. Did you? Yes, I did actually. Um, I actually was looking through some papers uh, over Christmas up at my house in Fairbanks, and I ran across the Petromania Journal, the newsletters that Doc used to write about uh, going out to Little River Rock and banning petrels. Anybody down in Humboldt be interested in that with the museum or library or anything like that, do you think? Uh, maybe uh, what, so, yeah. Why, Tim, why don't you go ahead and send it to me, and uh, I'll probably, yeah, I'll put it, I'll put it in the archives, um, either with Tamar Donovsky or possibly we'll we'll see if it can be, uh, if they've got a copy in the library, in our in HSU library. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was, you know, the various titles. One chapter was it, it stings when it gets in the eyes. That's when you get puked on. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you guys. Ciao. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Tim. Okay, Tim. Well, um, you know, we're we're getting kind of late here. I think it's what, like 847, so I won't I won't spend a whole lot of time here, you know, but I'm just, you know, really so happy that so many people really wanted to say something and come together and and give a tribute to Doc. And, you know, obviously he was just such a huge part of so many people's lives and, and just like directed, uh, it was just like kind of a focus point for where people went after they met Stan and was under his tutelage and, and uh, influence their careers and stuff. And and it's just amazing to hear about all the stories. And another thing that I didn't really know, I, I had no idea he had red hair <laughs> until I looked at these photos when I was compiling the screen, the slideshow today and stuff. So I learned something new today about Doc, but it's just amazing to see like all of you guys come together and, and just, and say your part. And um, I don't, I don't know what else to say. You know, we, he, he, I moved here in 2003 and uh, I don't remember when I first met Doc, but I'm sure it was at the Arcata Marsh. 
And um, I do remember the first time Doc questioned one of my bird sightings. And I think it was a Hammond's flycatcher uh, at Mad River County Park. And I reported it. I think I called it in the bird box or something because eBird wasn't really a thing yet. Or I, I don't think it was 2003, 2004. I moved here in 2003. Um, and so he emailed me about it, asking about it. I was like, oh man, shoot, I better write something up. So I like, wrote up the whole thing and just like wrote everything that I remembered about it and sent it to him and stuff. And, and uh, that was kind of the start of our relationship. And um, I wrote down a couple of times that we went and chased birds together. So uh, let's see, 6 May, 2011, we went and chased a common crane together in Del Norte County, which was the first state record actually. And um, that was a really memorable trip, but I think it's soon after I had my Ford Escape that I got from Ed Pinolfino in, in, um, in Placer County, who was, he used to be a big county birder and visited all the counties in California before I got it from him. But um, so we went and chased the common crane in, in Del Norte County. So that was really neat to be able to share that with Doc. And then uh, in 21 June 2013, we went and chased Del Norte County's first uh, white rump sandpipers, which were three birds together in, um, at the Alexander Dairy Ponds. I'm sure many of you people um, are familiar with Alexander Dairy and, and the attractiveness of that pond to shorebirds and such. And then uh, 21 February 14, uh, we went and chased a black vulture down in um, Ferndale Bottoms. And that's actually the first time I met, and the only time I met Tracy actually. And we all rode together in Doc's car and Michael drove. And that was a really nice day. And Doc, um, he seemed like the type of person that if you invited him to something, he would always be there like no matter what he would show up and, you know, no matter how close you were, you know, he was just close to everybody. And, um, and so he, he, we, we weren't super close, but I invited him to our wedding reception uh, when my wife and I got married in 2008, August, 2008. And him and Lori came and um, it was really special to have him there. And, um, you know, we went and visited him many times at his house and just hung out and talked to birds and stuff. And I'd share bird photos with them and, you know, share eBird checklists of people's sightings and stuff with them. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just such a special, special guy. And I'm just so thankful to have gotten to know him the time that I did. And uh, that's about it. And I'm really thankful that everybody was here to say something about him. So thanks. And that's it. All right. I, I just in closing, I, I will say to, to the people that are still hanging in here uh, is that uh, Michael would still at some point probably like to hold a in-person uh, gathering. And uh, Doc actually came up to me at the uh, Western Field or uh, Western Field Ornithologist. I think that's the the group that was here a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago or four years ago, and uh, he asked me um, if I if Jan and I would hold a memorial for him. And and I remember saying at the time, I said, Doc, I'd much rather hold a party for you right now and invite the world. And uh, he didn't want to do that. He, he was really adamant about, no, 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 no. I'm talking about memorial. And so he was actually looking forward to the idea of, of a memorial. And so we brought the virtual part of it to fruition. But at some time, it seems like there's plenty of material here. So at some time, we, we might have one in person. So, OK, that's my bit. That's my last. Uh, I don't have anything else to add. Rob, it's back to you. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's it on my part too. Um, you know, I, 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 speaking of the uh, in-person memorial, I think Michael mentioned something about maybe this fall 
depending on how things go, um, you know, with the pandemic and stuff. And everybody's getting vaccinated. So, um, you know, keep your ear and eye to the ground about something like that in the future. And uh, hopefully we could all come together and, you know, and talk more about Doc and, and give each other hugs and, <laughs> and just, you know, be in person to celebrate his life and such, so. So this is a conclusion on behalf of Godwood Days. I would like to thank everyone for coming to this uh, virtual festival. I thought everyone did a fantastic job. Thank you, Rob, for being in the field and Gary and, and um, Bob and Shoshana for all the work they've done to bring this to you. And this evening was the, uh, the culmination of it all in honoring um, Stan Harris. So thank you for joining us and we'll hopefully see you in person or in virtual next year. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Gobbit Days Board. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex, for all you've done too. Yeah, absolutely. All <laughs> yeah. right. Good night now.